Oh, okay. We are live. So, hello and welcome back to the Much Ado About Something series. We are pleased to bring you a live Shakespeare reading today of The Merry Wives of Windsor. My name is Nathan Agan, an actor and host of the Working, Jer Working Actors Journey podcast. We have once again assembled a very impressive and quite accomplished cast who, surprisingly, were all available. <laughs> now, wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll also see a live chat box next to the video. Please feel free to share where you are and your comments as we go. Uh, there's also a sign up below to stay connected. And if we ever do something like this again, you'll be the first to know. Please also feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at WAJ Podcast and use the hashtag Merry Wives Live. And I do have a question for you to answer. What do you want to see in the future? What kinds of readings or events or other theater? You can drop a message in the live chat or on Twitter with your ideas. Uh, I would like to thank our collaborators, the City of Coronado Public Library and its director, Sean Briley, for making this technology available. And, for the San and to the San Diego Shakespeare Society, of which I am a member, for their support of this project. In fact, if you'd like to read Shakespeare with others, you can join the Society in the library as they have moved the open readings online. They are available to anyone, anywhere, whatever your level of experience. You can even just come and listen to the plays. So check out the Society's website to learn more details. Thank you to PlayShakespeare.com for providing the performance script, and finally to SAG-AFTRA. Now, let me introduce our amazing cast for the Merry Wives of Windsor as each says a quick hello. Sir John Falstaff, a rogue with no money but many plans, Peter Van Norden. Hello. Master Ford, a gentleman of Windsor, Harry Groner. Hey guys. And sitting right next to him, which is very wonderful, playing uh, Mistress Ford, Ford's wife, Don Didowick. Hi kids. <laughs> Playing Master Page, a wealthy gentleman, Tony Amendola. Uh, playing Mistress Page, Page's wife, Angie Bird. Hi. Uh, Dr. Caius, a French physician, and Nim, one of Falsaf's followers, Jeffrey Wade. That would be me. <laughs> and next to him is Mistress Quickly, Dr. Caius's housekeeper, Amelia White. Hi. Uh, Sir Hugh Evans, a Welsh parson and schoolmaster, Marcelo Tubert. Afternoon. <laughs> uh, host of the Garter Inn and innkeeper, Robert Pine. Oh. Uh, Robert Shallow, a justice of the peace, played by Alan Mandel. Hello. Uh, let's see, Abraham Slender, Shallow's rich nephew, and also playing William Page's son, Rob Crisell. Good afternoon. Uh, Fenton, a young gentleman, Ross Helwig. Hello. Pistol, one of Falstaff's followers, Aubrey Savarino. Hello. Playing Simple, Slender's servant, and Robin, Falstaff's servant, Susan Benninghoff. Hiya. Playing Bardolph, uh, one of Falstaff's followers, Rugby, Caius' servant, the first servant of the Fords, and one of the swings, Kevin Manley. Hello. And playing Anne, the page's daughter, and the second servant of the Fords, plus as a swing, Ashley Engelman. Hello. Now, for many of the actors you see here, there was a fantastic full-length interview with them on the Working Actors Journey podcast. So I invite you to check those out to hear lots more about their lives and careers. Again, links are all below. I do want to mention that Rob, Susan, Kevin, and Ashley are also members of the San Diego Shakespeare Society, and I'm thrilled that they can join us today. Fingers crossed that the tech gods are with us, though if anything does happen or anyone drops off for any reason, we will roll with it. And that's where Kevin and Ashley come in in his swings. This is just like live theater. So I appreciate the two of them willing to bravely jump into this. So where are we these days and what is going on in the world? Well, unlike almost any other time in history, we all need to work together. And that is why I've looked for plays that not only are fun to do, but really exemplify the strong ensemble that we need today. We all play a role in stopping this pandemic and getting back out there. We have so many great actors here today that trained in rotating repertory theater, where they worked with one company of actors performing in two to three different plays, doing different plays from one night to the next, trusting one another, relying on one another. There are no weak links here. Everyone is important and everyone plays a critical role, just like all of us. 
Yes, of course, the essential workers and medical staff are heroes for putting their lives at risk and doing the work to save others. And it's up to all of us to do our part too. We can't let anyone down. I know it's difficult. I know it can be scary, but together we will get through this and we will be stronger. Now, there are many fantastic charities and groups doing great work. And I just wanna highlight one of those, Project Cure. As the medical industry experiences a vast shortage of equipment, Project Cure is making all of their masks, gloves, PPEs, and other items available to hospitals and first responders to fight COVID-19. If you'd like to support their work, head to projectcurecure.org. And if you out there would like to share any other charities that you're supporting, please feel free to do so in the live chat. And tonight, we have a very special contest. Now, as you can see, I'm now sporting the COVID cut because I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, but others of the cast <laughs> have involuntarily entered the great hair off of 2020. So who is your winner for best uncut locks? And I think everyone is eligible. So put your vote in the chat or on Twitter with best hair and then the actor's name. Uh, again, you can send it to w at WAJ podcast. Uh, or put it in the live chat. We will announce the winner at intermission. Uh, at this time, if I could ask all the actors to hop off backstage, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Gideon Rappaport, a San Diego teacher and dramaturg. He is also a member of the San Diego Shakespeare Society and author of the forthcoming book, A Shakespeare Companion for Students. On a personal note, it has been such a gift for someone as dedicated and passionate as Gideon to work so tirelessly with all the actors and on the text. The dramaturg is often an overlooked role and I guarantee you that it pays large dividends. So Gideon, thank you so much for joining us. The play is The Merry Wives of Windsor and the floor is yours. Thank you. It pays large dividends to the production. I don't know about to the dramaturg, but I'm going to introduce the play. According to later report, Queen Elizabeth had so enjoyed the character of Falstaff in Shakespeare's Henry IV plays that she commanded another play be written within 14 days that would show Falstaff in love. If the story is true, The Merry Wives of Windsor was Shakespeare's fulfillment of that command. There is much pointless discussion among scholars about when the story is presumed to take place. George Page says that Fenton kept company with the wild prince and poems. Page means it as an accusation, but we may take it as a recommendation because we know from Henry IV part one that Prince Hal was only playing at being wild and that his reformation in part two was planned from the start. His wild days ended in 1413 when he became king. Apart from that reference, there is no indication of historical time in Mary Wives. In Act 5, the phrase, our radiant queen, presumably refers to Queen Elizabeth as well as to the fairy queen. It suggests that the real setting of the play is Shakespeare's contemporary England of about 1597. The Windsor of the play is the market town that developed near Windsor Castle up the Thames River from London, which had an actual inn called the Garter, built in the 14th century. In the late 19th century, it was joined to an inn called the Hart and is now the Hart and Garter Hotel. Just as the name Windsor implies both the middle-class market town and the royal palace, so the play depicts a middle-class English world in a way that would be entertaining for the highly literate Queen Elizabeth and her sophisticated aristocracy. The entertainment takes the form of an almost duel between Sir Hugh and Dr. Caius, the unjustified jealousy of Frank Ford and his disguise as Brooke, the merry but virtuous wives foiling of Falstaff's attempts at seduction, and the young lovers foiling of the bad parental marriage matches. But most entertaining to Shakespeare's audience, royal and public, is the language of the play. For Mary Wives is filled with extraordinary characters who fright the English language out of its wits. There is Sir Hugh Evans, 
the Welsh parson whose mastery of Latin is minimal and whose pronunciation of English is mocked. There is the French doctor Caius with his absurdly comical English pronunciation and vocabulary. There is Nim whose obsessive attachment to the faddish jargon word humor makes him an object of satire. And the host who is equally addicted to the word bully, a term of endearment meaning fine fellow. Young William Page falters in his recitation of the cases of a Latin pronoun. Sir Hugh miscorrects the recitation and Mistress quickly misunderstands it as profanity, adding more fun to her already great fund of malapropisms. Finally, the speeches of Slender make him a good candidate for the title of stupidest character in Shakespeare. Sharpen your ears now for Shakespeare's depiction of what H.J. Oliver, quoting Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady, calls the cold-blooded murder of the English tongue. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Gideon. That was, uh, that was really great. And uh, I, I personally love hearing uh, all that context about the play and those insights into it. Um, personally, I feel like this is a wonderfully underrated comedy with so many great characters and you're all, you all watching are in for a treat. Now, uh, each half of the play will run about 80 to 85 minutes and we will have a 10 minute intermission during which time we'll discuss the play a bit more, maybe even take some questions from the audience via the chat box. And don't forget about best hair. I'm already seeing some contenders come out. So that's, that's great. Uh, okay. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy our online reading of The Merry Wives of Windsor. Actors, places for the top of the show. One, scene one, Windsor, England, a street in front of Master and Mistress Page's house. Sir Hugh, persuade me not. I will make a star chamber matter of it. If he were 20, Sir John Falstaff, he, he shall not abuse uh, Robert Shallow, Esquire. In the county of Gloucester, justice of peace and quorum. Aye, cousin Slender, and Custalorum. Aye, and Radalorum too. And a gentleman born, Master Parson, who writes himself Armagero in any bill, warrant, quittance, or obligation, Armagero. Aye, that I do, and have done any time these 300 years. All his successors gone before him have done it, and all his ancestors that come after him may. They may give the dozen white looses in their coat. It's an old coat. The dozen white looses do become an old coat well. <clears throat> it agrees well, passant. It is a familiar beast to man and signifies love. The loose is the fresh fish. The salt fish is an old coat. I'm a quarter, cuz. You may, by marrying. It is marrying indeed, if he quarter it. Not a whit. Yes, per lady. If he has a quarter of your coat, there is but three skirts for yourself in my simple conjecture. But that is all one. If Sir John Falstaff have committed disparagements unto you, I am of the church and will be glad to do my benevolence to make atonements and compromises between you. The council shall hear it. It is a riot. No, it is not meet the council hear a riot. There is no fear of God in a riot. The council, look you, shall desire to hear the fear of God and not to hear a riot. Take your vitamins in that. Ha, ah, oh my life. If I were young again, the sword should end it. It is better that friends is the sword and end it. Oh, and there is also another device in my praying, which peradventure brings good discretions with it. There is Anne Page, which is daughter to Master George Page, which is pretty virginity. Mistress Anne Page, she has brown hair and speaks small like a woman. 
It is that fairy person for all the world, as just as you will desire. And 700 pounds of monies and gold and silver is her grandsire upon his deathbed, got delivered to a joyful resurrection, give when she is able to overtake 17 years old. Oh, it were a good motion if we leave our pribbles and prabbles and desire a marriage between Master Abraham and Mistress Anne Page. Did her grandsire leave her 700 pound? Aye, and her father is make her a petter penny. I know the young gentlewoman. She has good gifts. Oh, 700 pounds and possibilities is good gifts. <laughs> well, let us see, honest Master Page. Is Falstaff here? Well, shall I tell you a lie? Oh, I, I do despise a liar as I do despise one that is false, or as I despise one that is not true. The Knight Sir John is there, and I beseech you be ruled by your well-willers. I will peat the door for Master Page. What ho? Got Who's there? Here. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Here is God's blessing and your friend uh, and just a shallow and here young master slender that peradventure shall tell you another tale if matters grow to your likings. I am glad to see your worships well. I thank you for my venison, Master Shallow. Master Page, I'm glad to see you. Much good do it your good heart. I wished your venison better, it was killed. How doth good Mistress Page, and thank you always with my heart, love Sir, I, with my heart. I, th I thank you. Sir, I thank you by yea and no, I do. I am glad to see you, good Master Slender. How does your fellow greyhound, sir? I heard say he was out running on Cotsall. Uh, he could not be judged, sir. You'll not confess. You'll not confess. That he will not. Tis your fault. Tis your fault. Tis a good dog. He's a cur, sir. Sir, he's a good dog and a fair dog. Can there be more said? He is good and fair. Is Sir John Falstaff there, here? Sir, he is within, and I would I could do a good office between you. Oh, it is spoke as a Christian's ought to speak. He hath wronged me, Master Page. Well, sir, he doth in some sort confess it. If it be confessed, it is not redressed. Is that not so, Master Page? He hath wronged me, indeed he hath. And a word he hath, believe me, Robert Shallow, Esquire, saith he is wronged. Here comes Sir John. Now, Master Shallow, you'll complain of me to the king. Knight, you have beaten my men, killed my deer, and broke open my lodge. But not kissed your keeper's daughter. Chatterpin, this shall be answered. I will answer it straight. I have done all this. That is now answered. The uh, council shall know this. It were better for you if it were known in council. You'll be laughed at. Talk about us, Sir John. Good words. Good warts. Good cabbage. Mm. Slender, I broke your head. What matter have you against me? Mary, sir, I have matter in my head against you and mm. against your coney-catching rascals, barred off Nim and Pistol. They carried me to the tavern and made me drunk and afterward picked my pocket. You Banbury cheese. Aye, uh, it is no matter. How now, Mephistopheles? Aye, uh, it is no matter. <laughs> I say, poker, poker, slice, that's my humor. Where's simple, my man? Can you tell, cousin? A piece, I pray you. Now, now, let us understand. There is three umpires in this matter, as I understand. That is, Master Page, Fidelis at Master Page, and there is myself, Fidelis at myself, and the three party is, lastly and finally, mine host of the garter. We three to hear it and end it between them. Fairy court. I will make a brief of it in my notebook, and we will afterwards work upon the cause with as great discreetly as we can. Pistol! <laughs> he hears with ears. Ah, 
the devil in his town. What phrase is this? He hears with ear? Why, it is affectations. Pistol, did you pick Master Slender's purse? I buy these gloves, did he? Or I, I might never come in my own chamber again else of seven groats in mill sixpences and two Edward shovel boards that cost me two shilling and tuppence a piece of Yed Miller. Buy these gloves. Is <laughs> this true pistol? No, it, it is false if it is a pig purse. <laughs> Thou mountain foreigner, Sir John and Master Mine, I combat challenge of this Latin Bilbo. Word of denial in thy labras here. Word of denial, froth and scum, thou liest. Abide these gloves, then, twas he. Be advised, sir, and pass good humors. I will say merry trap with you if you run the nuthook's humor on me. That's the very note of it. Well, buy this hat, then. He in the red face had it. For though I cannot remember what I did when you made me drunk, yet I am not altogether an ass. <laughs> what say you, Scarlet and John? Why, sir, for my part, I say the gentleman had drunk himself out of his five sentences. <laughs> it is his five senses. Ay, <laughs> what the, the ignorance is. Ah. And being fap, sir, was, as they say, cashiered. And so conclusions passed the careers. Ah, oh, you spake in Latin then, too. But tis no matter. I'll ne'er be drunk again whilst I live, but in honest, civil, godly company for this trick. I'll be drunk with those that have the fear of God and not with drunken knaves. Oh, oh God, judge me. That is a virtuous mind. You hear all these matters denied, gentlemen. You hear it. Nay, daughter, carry the wine in. We'll drink within. Oh, heaven! This is Mistress Anne Page. How now, Mistress Ford? Mistress Ford, by my trust, you are very well met. By your leave, good mistress. Wife, bid these gentlemen welcome. Come. We have a hot venison patsy to drink. Huh? Come, oh. gentlemen. I hope we shall drink down all unkindness. <laughs> oh, I had rather than 40 shillings, I had my book of songs and sonnets here. How now, simple, where have you been? I must wait on myself, must I? You have not the book of riddles about you, have you? A uh, uh, book of riddles? Why, did you not lend it to Alice Shortcake Bonnell Halamus last? A fortnight of Whore Michaelmas? Come, cars, come, cars, we stay for you. A word with you, cars. Marry this, cars. There is, as it were, a tender, a kind of tender, made afar off by Sir Hugh here. Do you understand me? Aye, sir, you shall find me reasonable. If it be so, I shall do that. That is reason. Nay, nay, but understand me. So I do, sir. Give ear to his motions, Master Slender. I will description the matter to you if you be capacity of it. Nay, I will do as my cousin Shallow says. I pray you pardon me. He's a justice of peace in his country, simple though I stand here. But, but that is not the question. The question is concerning your marriage. Aye, aye, there's the point, sir. Marry is it, there is, marry is it the very point of it to Mistress Anne Page. Why, if it be so, I will marry her upon any reasonable demands. But can you affection the woman? Let us command to know that of your mouth or, or of your lips, or for divers philosophers hold that the lips is parcel of the mouth. Therefore, precisely, can you carry your good will to the maid? Cousin Abraham Slender, can you love her? I hope so, sir, as it shall become one that would do reason. Nay, God's lords and his ladies, you must be positable if you can carry her your desires towards her. That you must. Will you, upon good dowry, marry her? I will do a greater thing than that upon your request, cousin, in any reason. Nay, nay, conceive me, conceive me, sweet cuz. What I do is to pleasure you, cuz. Can you love the maid? 
I will marry her, sir, at your request. But if there be no great love in the beginning, yet heaven may decrease it upon better acquaintance when we are married <clears throat> and have more occasion to know one another, I hope upon familiarity will grow more content. But if you say marry her, I will marry her. That I am freely dissolved and resolutely. It is a very discretion answer, save the fall is in the word dissolutely. The word is, according to our meaning, resolutely. His meaning is good. I, I, I think my cousin meant well. I, or else I would, I might be hanged, Law. <laughs> oh, here comes fair Mistress Anne. Would I were young for your sake, Mistress Anne. Dinner is on the table. My father desires your worship's company. I will wait on him, fair Mistress Anne. God's blessed will. I will not be absent at the grace. <laughs> will it please your worship to come in, sir? No, I thank you for sooth hardly. I am very well. The dinner attends you, sir. I am not a hungry. I thank you for sooth. Go, uh, sirrah, for all you are my man, go wait upon my cousin Shallow. <laughs> A justice of peace may sometime be beholding to his friend for a man. I keep but three men and a boy yet till my mother be dead, but what though? <laughs> yet I live like a poor gentleman born. <laughs> I may not go in without your worship. They will not sit till you come. Uh, in faith, I'll eat nothing. I thank you as much as though I did. I pray you, sir, walk in. I'd rather walk here. <laughs> I bruised my shin the other day with playing at sword and dagger with a master of fence, three vennies for a dish of stewed prunes, and by my troth I cannot abide the smell of hot meat since. <laughs> Why do your dogs bark so? Be there bears in the town? I think there are, sir. I heard them talked of. I love the sport well, but I shall as soon quarrel at it as any man in England. You are afraid when you see the bear loose, are you not? Aye, indeed, sir. That's meat and drink to me now. I have seen Sackerson loose 20 times and I have taken him by the chain, but I warrant you, the women have so cried and shrieked at it, had it oh, passed. But women indeed cannot abide them. They are very <clears throat> ill-favored rough things. Come, come, gentle master slender, come. We stay for you. I'll eat nothing, I thank you, sir. By cock and pie you shall not choose. Sir, come, come. Nay, pray you lead the way. Oh, come on, sir. Mistress Anne, yourself shall go first. Not I, sir, I pray you keep on. Truly, I will not go first, truly, la. I will not do you that wrong. I pray you, sir. I'd rather be unmannerly than troublesome. You do yourself <laughs> wrong, la, indeed. <laughs> Act one, scene two, Windsor, the same street in front of the page's house. Uh, go your ways and ask of Dr. Ka uh, and ask of Dr. Caius' house, which is the way? And there dwells one mistress quickly, which in the manner of his, is the manner of his nurse or his dry nurse uh, or his cook or, or his laundry, his washer and his ringer. <laughs> well, sir. Uh, oh, nay, 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 uh, nay, nay, it is better yet, uh, give her this letter. For it is a woman that's altogether acquaintance with Mistress Anne Page. And the letter is to desire and require her to solicit your master's desires to Mistress Anne Page. Look, I pray you, be calm. I will make an end of my dinner. <laughs> There's pippins and cheese to come. Mm -mm -mm -mm. <clears throat> Act One, Scene Three, A Room at the Garter Inn. Mine host of the garter. Ah, what say my bully rook? Speak scholarly and wisely. Truly, mine host, I must turn away some of my followers. 
Oh, discard, good bully Hercules, cashier. Let them wag. Tra, tra, tra. I sit at ten pounds a week. Thou art an emperor, Caesar, Kaiser, and Vizier. I will entertain Bardolph. He shall draw, he shall tap. Said I well, bully Hector? Do so, good mine host. Ah, uh, I have spoke. Let him follow. Let me see thee froth and lime. I am at a word. Follow. Bardolph, follow him. A tapster is a good trade. <laughs> An old cloak makes a new jerkin, a withered serving man, a fresh tapster. Go, adieu. It is a life that I have desired. Ah. I will thrive. How the spigot wheeled. He was gotten in drink. <laughs> is not the humor conceited? I am glad I am so acquit of this tinderbox. His thefts were too open. His filching was like an unskillful singer. He kept not time. The good humor is to steal at a minute's rest. Convey, the wise call it steal. Fuck, a fico for the phrase. Well, sirs, I am almost out at heels. Why then let Kybes ensue? There's no remedy. I must coney catch. <laughs> I must shift. Young ravens must have food. Which of you know Ford of this town? I can the white. He is of substance good. My honest lad, I will tell you what I am about. Two yards and more. <laughs> no quips now, pistol indeed. I am in the waist two yards about. <laughs> but I, I am now about no waist. I am about thrift. Briefly. I do mean to make love to Ford's wife. <laughs> I spy entertainment in her. Ooh, she discourses, she carves, she gives the leer of invitation. <laughs> I can construe the action of her familiar style and the hardest voice of her behavior to be English rightly is I am Sir John Falstaffs. Well, he had studied her well and translated her will out of honesty into English. <laughs> Anchor is deep. Will that humor pass? Uh, the report goes she has all the rule of her husband's purse. He hath a legend of angels. As many devils entertain, and to her boy, I say. <laughs> Arises, it is good. <laughs> Humor me, the angels. I have written me here a letter to her. And here is another to Paige's wife, who even now gave me good eyes too, examined my parts with most judicious Iliads. Sometimes the beam of her view gilded my foot, sometimes my portly belly. Then did the sun on dunghill shine. <laughs> Thank thee for that humor. Oh, she did course o'er my exteriors with such a greedy intention that the appetite of her eye did seem to scorch me up like a burning glass. <laughs> Here's another letter to her. She bears the purse too. She is a region in Guiana, all gold and bounty. <laughs> I will be cheaters to them both, and they shall be exchequers to me. <laughs> they shall be my East and West Indies, and I will trade to them both. <laughs> Go, bear thou this letter to Mistress Page, and thou this to Mistress Ford. We will thrive, lads, we will thrive. Shall I, sir, Pandarus of Troy, become, and by my side wear steel, then Lucifer take all. I will run no base humor, here, take the humor letter. Hmm. I will keep the behavior of reputation. Oh. Hold, Sirrah. Bear you these letters tightly. Sail like my, my pinnace to those golden shores. Hmm? Rogues, hence, avaunt. Oh. Vanish like hailstones. Go, trudge, plod away the hoof. Seek shelter. Pack! Falstaff will learn the humor of the age. French fifth rift, you rogues. 
myself and skirted pain. <laughs> Let vultures gripe thy guts. Yeah. For Gordon, Fulham holds and high and low beguiles the rich and poor. Tester, I'll have in pouch when thou shalt lack base for and Turk. I have operations in my head, which be humors of revenge. Wilt thou revenge? I welcome and her star. With wit or steel? With both the humors, I, I will discuss the humor of this love to page. Oh, and I to forge shall eke unfold how Falstaff varlet vile, his dove will prove, his gold will hold, and his soft couch defile. And my humor shall not cool. I will incense page to deal with poison. I will possess him with yellowness, for the revolt of mine is dangerous. That is my true humor. Thou art the Mars of malcontents. I second thee. Troop on. <laughs> Act one, scene four, a room in Dr. Caius's house. What? John Rugby, I pray thee go to the casement and see if you can see my master, Master Dr. Caius coming. If he do it, Faith, and find anybody in the house, there will be an old abusing of God's patience and the King's English. I'll go watch. Go. And we'll have a posset for it soon at night, if Faith, in the latter end of a sea coal fire. He's an honest, willing, kind fellow, as ever servant shall come into house with all. And I warrant you, no telltale, no breed bait. His worst fault is that he's given to prayer. And he's something peevish that way, but nobody has but his fault. Let that pass. So, Mr. S Peter Simple, you say your name is? I for fault of a better. And Master Slender's your master? I, forsooth. Does he not wear a round beard like a glover's paring knife? No, forsooth, he hath but a little way face with a little yellow beard. A cane-colored beard. A softly sprited man, is he not? I, forsooth, but he is as tall a man of his hands as any is between this and his head. He hath fought with a warrener. Oh, how say you? Oh, I should remember him. Does he not hold up his head, as it were, and strut in his gait? Yes, indeed, does he? Well, heaven send Anne Page no worse fortune. <laughs> Tell Master Parson Evans I will do what I can for you, Master. Anne is a good girl, and I wish... Oh, the alas! Here comes my master! Oh, we shall all be shent. Run in here, you good man. Go into this closet. He, he will not stay long. What? John Rugby. J John, what? John, I say. Go, John. Go inquire for my master. I, I doubt he be not well that he comes not home. And a down, a down, a down, a down, a down. Oh. What is it you sing? I do not like these toys. Pray you. Go and fetch me in my closet un boite en verde. A box, a green box. Do you intend what I speak? A green box. Aye, forsooth, I'll fetch it you. I'm glad he went not in himself. If he'd found the young man, he would have been horn mad. Ma foi, il fait for sure. Je m'envoie à la cour, la grande affaire. Hey, is this it, sir? Oui, uh, mettez-le en mon pocket. Mm -hmm. Dépêche quickly. Oh. Yeah. There is that knave Rugby. Oh, John Rugby. John? Here, sir. You're John Rugby and you're Jack Rugby. Come, take your rapier and come after me, after, on your heel, to the court. Tis ready here, sir, sir, here in the porch. Damn, I thought I tarried too long. Uh, Zimmy, que j'oublie. 
Uh, there is some uh, samples in my closet that I will not for the world I shall leave behind. I mean, you'll find the young man there and you'll be mad. Ah, oh, diable, diable. What is in my closet? Oh, <laughs> villainy! La rune! Rugby, my rapier! Master, master, be content. Wherefore shall I be content? Well, the young man is an honest man. What, what shall an honest man do in my closet? There is no honest man that shall come in my closet. I beseech you, be not so phlegmatic. Uh, Hear the truth of it. Uh, more. He came of an errand to me from Parson Hugh. Well... Uh, I forsooth to desire her to to peace, I pray uh, you. Peace of your tongue. Speak your tale. To desire this honest gentlewoman, your maid, to speak a good word to Mistress Anne Page for uh, for my master in the way of marriage. <laughs> This is all indeed, la. I can't there put my finger in the fire and need not. <laughs> so you, send you, rugby, belle me some paper, tarry you a while. <laughs> Glad he's so quiet. If he'd been so, so thoroughly moved, you should have heard him so loud and so melancholy. But notwithstanding, man, I'll do you, your master, what good I can. And the very yea and the no is. The French doctor, my master, I may call him my master, look you, for I keep his house. And I wash, I ring, brew, bake, scour, dress meat and drink, and make the beds do all myself. Tis a great charge to come under one body's hand. You have eyes to that. You shall find it a great charge and to be up early and down late, but notwithstanding. To tell you in your ear, I would have no words of it. My master himself is in love with Mistress Anne Page, but notwithstanding that, I know Anne's mind, and that's neither here nor there. <laughs> you, Jacquinette, give us this letter to Sir Hugh. Begar, it is a challenge, huh? <laughs> I will cut his throat in the park, and I will teach a scurvy jack and a priest to meddle or make. Huh? You may be gone. It is not good you tarry here. Begar, I will cut all his two stones, Begar. He shall not have a stone to throw at the dog. Alas. He speaks but for his friend. It is no matter for that. Do not you tell me that I shall have on page for myself? Begar, I will kill the jack priest, and I have appointed mine host of the Jarter to measure our weapon. Begar, I will myself have on page. Sir, sir, the maid loves you, and all shall be well. We, we must give folks leave to pray, what the good year. Uh, rugby, come to the court with me. Begar, if I have not on page, I shall turn your head out of my door. Follow my heels, Rugby. You shall have Anne fool's head of your own. No, I know Anne's mind for that. Never a woman in Windsor knows more of Anne's mind than I do, nor can do more than I do with her, that, thank heaven. Who's within there, ho? Who's there, I trow? Uh, come near the house, I pray you. How now, good woman, how dost thou? Oh, the better that it pleases your good worship to ask. What news? How does pretty Mistress Anne? Um, in truth, sir, she is pretty and honest and gentle and one that is your friend. I can tell you that, by the way. I praise heaven for it. Shall I do any good, thinks thou? Shall I not lose my suit? Trust, sir, all is in his hands above. But notwithstanding, Master Fenton, I'll be sworn on a book. She loves you. Have your worship not a ward above your eye? Yes, Mary, have I. What of that? Well, 
thereby hangs a tale. Good faith, it's such another nan, but I detest as honest a maid as ever broke bread. We had an hour's talk of that wart. I shall never laugh but in that maid's company. <laughs> but indeed, she's given too much to Alicolly and musing. But for you, well, go to. Well, I shall see her today. Hold. There's money for thee. Oh. Let me have thy voice in my behalf. If thou seest her before me, commend me. Will I? Ah, faith, that we will. And I will tell you, we'll ship more of the wart the next time we have confidence, and of other wooers. Well, farewell. I'm in great haste now. Farewell, your worship. Oh, truly, an honest gentleman. But Anne loves him not, for I know Anne's mind as well as another does. Now, out upon, what have I forgot? Act two, scene one, Windsor, a street in front of the page's house. Oh, but have I, have I escaped love letters in the holiday time of my beauty and am I subject for them now? Let's see. Ask me no reason why I love you for though love use reason for his precision, he admits him not for his counselor. You are not young, no more am I, go to then, there's sympathy. You are merry, so am I, ha ha, then there's more sympathy. You love sack and so do I, I would you desire better sympathy? Let it suffice thee, Mistress Page, at the least if the love of a soldier can suffice that I love thee. I will not say pity me, tis not a soldier-like phrase, but I say love me. By me, thine own true knight, by day or night, or any kind of light, with all his might for thee to fight, John Falstaff? Oh, oh, what a herod of jewelry is this? A wicked, wicked world. That one that is well nigh worn to pieces with age to show himself a young gallant. What unweighed behavior hath this Flemish drunkard picked with the devil's name out of my conversation that he dares in this manner to assay me? He had not been thrice in my company. What did I say to him? I was then frugal of my mirth. Heaven forgive me. Why, I'll exhibit a bill in the parliament for the putting down of men. How shall I be revenged on him? For revenged I will be, as sure as his guts are made of puddings. Mistress Page, ah, trust me. I was going to your house. And trust me, I was coming to you. You look very ill. Nay, nay, I'll never believe that. I have to show to the contrary. Well, faith you do in my mind. Well, I do then. Yet say I could show you to the contrary. Oh, Mistress Page, give me some counsel. Well, what's the matter, woman? Oh, woman, if it were not for one trifling respect, I could come to such honor. Well, hang the trifle, woman. Take the honor. What is it? I dispense with trifles. What is it? If I could but go to hell for an eternal moment or so, I could be knighted. What? Thou liest. liest. <laughs> Sir <laughs> Alex. Lord, these knights will hack, and so thou shouldst not alter the article of thy gentry. We burn daylight. Here, read, read, read. Perceive how I might be knighted. <laughs> I shall think the worth of fat men, as long as I have eye to make difference of men's liking. 
And yet he would not swear, praised women's modesty and gave such orderly and well-behaved proof to all uncommonness that I would have sworn his disposition would have gone to the truth of his words. But they do no more adhere and keep place together than the hundred psalm to the tune of green sleeves. <laughs> what tempest I throw through this whale with so many tons of oil in his belly ashore at Windsor. Oh, how shall I be revenged on him? I think the best way were to entertain him with hope till the wicked fire of lust had melted him in his own grease. <laughs> Did you ever hear the like? <laughs> letter for letter, but that the name of page and four differs. To thy great comfort in this mystery of ill opinions, here is the twin brother of thy letter. <gasps> but let thine inherit first, for I protest mine never shall. <laughs> I, I warrant he have a thousand of these letters writ with blank space for different names. Sure more, and these are of the second edition. He will print them out of doubt, for he cares not what he puts in the press when he would put us to. I had rather be a giantess and lie under Mount Pelion than, well, I will find you 20 lascivious turtles ere one chaste man. Why, this is the very same. The very hand, the very words. What doth he think of us? Nay, I know not. I, it makes me almost ready to wrangle with mine own honesty. I'll entertain myself like one that I am not acquainted with all. For sure, unless he knows some strain in me that I know not myself, he would never have boarded me in this fury. Boarding, call you it? I'll be sure to keep him above deck. Yeah, so will I. If he come, to, uh, come under my hatches, I'll never to see again. <laughs> Let's be revenged on him. Let's appoint him a meeting. Give him a show of comfort in his suit and lead him on with a fine baited delay till he hath pawned his horses to mine host of the garter. Nay, I will consent to any villainy against him that may not sully the chariness of our honesty. Oh, that my husband saw this letter, it would give eternal food to his jealousy. Oh, I look where he comes. And, and my goodman too. He is as far from jealousy as I am from giving him cause, and that, I hope, is an unmeasurable distance. You are the happier woman. Let's consult together against this breezy night. Come hither. Well, I hope it be not so. Hope is a curdled dog in some affairs. Sir John affects thy wife. Why, sir, my wife is not young. He woos both high and low, both rich and poor, both young and old, one with another, Ford. He loves the Gallimaufry, Ford. Her penned. Love my wife? With liver burning hot. Prevent, or go thou like Sir Acteon, he, with ringwood at thy heels. Oof, odious is the name. What name, sir? The Horn, I say. Farewell, take heed, have open eye, for thieves do foot by night. Take heed, ere summer comes, or cuckoo birds do sing. Away, Sir Corporal Nim, believe it, page, he speaks sense. I will be patient, I will find out this. And this is true, I like not the humor of lying. He hath wronged me in some humors. I should have borne the humored letter to her, but I have a sword and it shall bite upon my necessity. He loves your wife. Uh, that's the long and the short. My name is Corporal Nim. I speak and I avouch. Tis true. 
My name is Nim, and Falstaff loves your wife. I do. I love not the humor of bread and cheese, and there's the humor of it. I do. The humor of it, quoth he. Here's a fellow fries English out of its wits. I will seek out Falstaff. <laughs> I never heard such a drawling, affecting knave. Well, if I do find it, well. Uh, I will not believe such a Cathayan, though the priest of the town commended him for a true man. It was a good, sensible fellow, well. How oh, now, Meg? Ah. <laughs> well, whither go you, George, hark you? How oh, now, sweet Frank? Why art thou melancholy? I melancholy? I'm not melancholy. Get you home, go. <laughs> Faith, thou hast some crotchets in thy head now. Will you go, Mistress Page? I have with you. Uh, you'll come to dinner, George? Hmm. Oh, look, who comes yonder? She shall be our messenger to this paltry night. Trust me, I thought on her. She'll fit it. Uh, you're come to see my daughter, Anne. Aye, forsooth. Uh, and how are you? How does good Mistress Anne? We'll go with us and see. Uh, we have an hour's talk with you. How now, Master Ford? You heard what this knave told you, did you not? Yes, and you heard what the other one told me. Yes. Do you think there is truth in them? Oh, hang them, slaves. I do not think the knight would offer it. But these that accuse him in the intent towards our wives are a yoke of his discarded men, very rogues. Now they be out of the service. Were they his men? Mary, they were. I like it never the better for that. Does he lie at the garter? Ay, <laughs> Mary, does he. If he should intend this voyage towards my wife, I will turn her loose on him. And what he gets more of her than her sharp words, let it lie on my head. I do not misdoubt my misdoubt my wife, but I would be loath to turn them together. A man may be too confident. I would have nothing lie on my head. I cannot be thus satisfied. Mm. Look, look where my ranting host of the garter comes. There is either liquor in his pate or money in his purse when he looks as merrily. How now, mine host? How now, bully rook? Thou art a gentleman, a cavaliero justice, I say. I follow, mine host, I follow. Good evening, twenty, good Master Page. Master Page, will uh, you go with us? We have sports in hand. Tell him, Cavaliero Justice. Tell him, Bully Rook. So there is a fray to be fought between Sir Hugh, the Welsh priest, and Caius, the French doctor. Uh, good, mine host of the garter, a word with you. Uh, what sayest thou, my Bully Rook? Hast thou no su suit against my knight, my guest Cavalier? No, I protest, but I'll give you a pottle of burnt sack if you give me recourse to him and tell him my name his brook, <laughs> did only for a jest. Uh, my hand, bully, uh, thou shalt have <laughs> egress and regress, uh, said I well, and thy name shall be Brook. It is a merry night. Will you go, mine hairs? Will you go with us to behold it? My merry host hath had the measuring of their weapons, and I think hath appointed them contrary places. For believe me, I hear the parson is no jester. Hark, I will tell you what our sport shall be. I have heard the Frenchman hath good skill in his rapier. Tut, sir, I could have told you more. In these times you stand on distance, your passes, staccados, and I know not what. Tis the heart, Master Page, tis here, tis here. I have seen the time with my long sword, I would have made you four tall fellows skip like rats. Here, boys, here, here, shall we wag? Uh, have with you, I'd rather hear them scold than fight. Though Paige be a secure fool, 
and stand so firmly on his wife's frailty, yet I cannot put off my opinion so easily. She was in his company at Page's house, and what they made there I know not. Well, I will look further into it. And I have a disguise to sound Falstaff. If I find her honest, I lose not my labor. If she be otherwise, tis labor well bestowed. Act two, scene two, a room in the garter inn. I will retort the sum in equipage. I will not lend thee a penny. <sighs> Why then the world's mine oyster, which I with sword will open. Uh, not a penny. I have been content, sir, you should lay my countenance to pawn. I have grated upon my good friends for three reprieves for you and your coach fellow Nim, or else you had looked through the grate like a gemini of baboons. I am damned in hell for swearing to gentlemen, my friends, you were good soldiers and tall fellows. And when Mistress Bridget lost the handle of her fan, I took it upon mine honor thou hadst it not. It's not thou share, hadst not thou fifteen pence. Reason, you rogue, reason. Thinks thou I'll engender my soul gratis? At a word, hang no more about me. I am no gibbet for you, go. A short knife and a throng to your manner of picked hatch, go. You'll not bear me a letter for me, you rogue. You stand upon your honor. Why, thou unconfinable baseness. It is as much as I can do to keep the terms of my honor precise. I, I. I myself, sometimes leaving the fear of God on the left hand and hiding mine honor in my necessity, I'm fain to shuffle, <laughs> to hedge, to lurch. And yet you, rogue, will ensconce your rags, your catamount in looks, your red lattice phrases, and your bold beating oaths under the shelter of your honor? You will not do it? You? I do relent. What would thou more of man? Uh, here. Sir, here's a woman would speak with you. Hmm. Let her approach. <laughs> Give your worship good morrow. Good morrow, good wife. Not so, and please your worship. Oh, good maid, then. I'll be sworn, as my mother was the first hour I was born. I do believe the swearer. <laughs> what with me? Shall I vouchsafe, your worship, a word or two? Two thousand, fair woman, and I'll vouchsafe thee the hearing. Um, there is one Mistress Ford, sir. I pray you, come a little nearer this ways. I myself dwell with Master Dr. Caius. Uh, well, on. Mistress Ford, you say? Your worship says very true. I pray your worship, come a little nearer this ways. Uh, I warrant thee nobody hears. Mine own people. <laughs> Mine own people. Are they so? Well, God bless them and make them his servants. Well, Mistress Ford, what of her? Well, sir, she's a good creature. Lord, Lord. Your worships are wanton. Uh, Forgive you and all of us, I pray. <laughs> Mistress Ford, come, Mistress Ford. Mary, this is the short and the long of it. You have brought her into such a canaries as tis wonderful. The best courtier of them all when the court lay at Windsor could never have brought her to such a canary. Oh. Yet there have been knights and lords and gentlemen with their coaches, I warrant you, Coach after coach, letter after letter, gift after gift, oh, smelling so sweetly, all musk and so rushling. I warrant you in silk and gold and in such elegant terms and in such wine and sugar of the best and the fairest that would have won any woman's heart. And I warrant you, they could never get an eye wink of her. 
I had myself 20 angels given me this morning, but I defy all angels in any such sort, as they say, but in the way of honesty. And I warrant you, they could never get her to so much as sip on a cup with the proudest of them all. And yet there's been earls, nay, which is more, pensioners. But I warrant you, all is one with her. What says she to me? Be brief, my good she Mercury. Uh, Mary, she hath received your letter, for the which she thanks you a thousand times, and she gives you to notify that her husband will be absent from his house between ten and eleven. Ten and eleven. I forsooth, and then you may come and see the picture, she says, that you wot of. Oh. Master Ford, her husband, will be from home. Alas, the sweet woman leads an ill life with him. He's a very jealousy man. She leads a very framp old life with him. Good heart. Ten and eleven. Woman, commend me to her. I will not fail her. Why, you say well. But I have another messenger, messenger to your worship. Mistress Page hath her hearty commendations to you too. Oh. Let me tell Near ear. She's as far too as a civil, modest wife, and one, I tell you, that will not miss you morning nor evening prayer as any as in Windsor, whoever be the other. And she bade me tell your worship that her husband is seldom from home, but she hopes there will come a time. I never knew a woman so dote upon a man. Surely, I think you have charms, La, yes. In truth. Not I, I assure thee. <laughs> Setting the attraction of my good parts aside, I have no other charms. Well, blessings on your heart for it. But, uh, I, I pray thee, tell me this. Has Ford's wife and Page's wife acquainted each other how they love me? <laughs> well, that were a jest indeed. Oh. <laughs> oh, they have not so little grace, I hope. Oh. But that were a trick indeed. But Miss. Page would desire you to send her your little page of all loves. Her husband has a marvellous infection to the little page, and truly Master Page is an honest man. Never a wife in Windsor leads a better life than she does. Do what she will, say what she will, take all, pay all, go to bed when she list, rise when she list. All is as she will, and truly she deserves it for it. If there be a kind woman in Windsor, she is one. You must send her your page, no remedy. Why, I, I will. Nay, then do so. And look you, he may come and go between you both. And in any case, have a nay word that you may know one another's mind and that the boy should never need understand anything. For it's not good that children should know any wickedness. Old folks, you know, have discretion, as they say, and know the world. Very well. Commend me to them both. There's my purse. Oh. My, my debtor. <laughs> uh, this news distracts me. <laughs> Sayest thou so, old Jack? Go thy way. I'll make more of thy body than I have done. Will they yet look after thee? Wilt thou, after the expense of so much money, be now a gainer? Oh, good body, I thank thee. <laughs> Let them say tis grossly done, so it be fairly done, no matter. Sir, there's one Master Brook below would fain speak with you and be acquainted with you, and hath sent your worship a morning's draught of sack. Oh, Brook is his name? Aye, sir. Call him in. Such brooks are welcome to me that o'erflows such liquor. <laughs> oh, Mistress Ford and Mistress Page, have I encompassed you? Go to Via. God bless you, sir. And you, sir, would you speak with me? I, I make bold to press with so little preparation upon you. Oh, welcome. What's your will? Give us leave, draw. Sir. I am a gentleman that have spent much. Uh, my name is Brooke. Master Brooke, I desire more acquaintance of you. 
Uh, good Sir John, I sue for yours. Uh, and not to change you, for I must let you understand that I think myself in better plight for a lender than you are. <laughs> the witch hath something emboldened me to this unseasoned intrusion. For they say, if money go before, all ways do lie open. Money is a good soldier, sir, and will arm. That troth, and I have a bag of money here troubles me. If you will help me bear it, Sir John, take all or half for easing me of the carriage. Well, I know not how I may deserve to be your porter. Well, I will tell you, sir, if you will give me the hearing. Speak, good Master Brooke, I shall be glad to be your servant. Sir, I hear you are a scholar. I will be brief with you. And you have been a man long known to me, though I had never so good means as desire to make myself acquainted with you. I shall discover a thing to you wherein I must very much lay open mine own imperfection. But, good Sir John, as you have one eye upon my follies, as you hear them unfolded, turn another into the register of your own, that I may pass with a reproof the easier, if you yourself know how easy it is to be such an offender. Very well, sir. Proceed. Uh, well, there is a gentlewoman in this town. Her husband's name is Ford. Oh, well, sir. <laughs> I have long loved her, and I protest to you, bestowed much on her, followed her with a doting observance, engrossed opportunities to meet her, feed every slight occasion that could but niggardly give me sight of her, not only bought many presents to give her, but have given largely to many to know what she would have given. Briefly, I have pursued her as love hath pursued me, which hath been on the wing of all occasions. But whatsoever I have merited, either in my mind or in my means, mead I am sure I have received none, unless experience be a jewel, and that I have purchased at an infinite rate. And that has taught me to say this, love like a shadow flies when substance love pursues. Pursuing that that flies, and flying what pursues. Huh. Have you received no promise of satisfaction at her hands? Never. Have you importuned her to such a purpose? Never. Of what quality was your love then? Well, like a fair house built on another man's ground, so that I have lost my edifice by mistaking the place where I erected it. Hmm. To what purpose have you unfolded this to me? Uh, when I have told you that, I have told you all. Now, some say that though she appear honest to me, yet in other places she enlargeth her mirth so far that there is shrewd construction made of her. Now, yes. Sir, Sir John, here is the heart of my purpose. You are a gentleman and of excellent breeding, admirable discourse, of great admittance, authentic in your place and person, generally allowed for your many warlike, court-like, and learned preparations. Oh, sir. I don't believe it, for you know it. <laughs> now, there is money. Spend it. Spend it. Spend more. Spend all I have. <laughs> oh. hey, hey, yes. Only give me so much of your time in exchange of it as to lay an amiable siege to the honesty of Ford's wife. Use your art of wooing. Win her to consent to you. If any man may, you may as soon as any. Would it apply well to the vehemency of your affection I should win what you would enjoy? <laughs> Methinks you prescribe to yourself very preposterously. <laughs> oh, understand my drift. She dwells so securely on the excellency of her honor that the folly of my soul dares not present itself. She is too high to be looked against. Now, could I come to her with any detection in my hand? My desires had instance and argument to commend themselves. I could drive her then from the ward of her purity, her reputation, her marriage vow, and a thousand other her defenses, which are now too, too strongly embattled against me. Mm. Uh, what say you to it, Sir John? Master Brooke, I will first make bold with your money. Yes. Next, give me your hand. 
<laughs> Last, as I am a gentleman, thou and you will enjoy Ford's wife. Oh, good, sir. I say you shall. Uh, want no money, Sir John. You shall want none. Want no mistress Ford, Master Brooke. You shall want none. <laughs> I shall be with her, I may tell you, by her own appointment. Even as you came to me, her assistant or, or go-between parted from me. I say I shall be with her between 10 and 11, for at that time, the jealous rascally knave, her husband, will be forth. <laughs> Come here to me at night. You shall know how I speed. I am blessed in your acquaintance. Do you, do you know Ford, sir? I'll hang him, poor cuckoldly knave. <laughs> I know him not, yet, yet I wrong to call him poor. They say the jealous wittily knave hath masses of money. Ah. His wife seems to me well favored. I will use her as the key of the cuckoldry rogue's coffer. <laughs> as my harvest home. Uh, I would you knew, Ford, sir, that you might avoid him if you saw him. I'll hang him, mechanical salt butter rogue. I will stare him out of his witch. <laughs> I will awe him with my cudgel. Ah. I shall hang like a meteor or the cuckold's horns. Master Brook, thou shalt know I will predominate over the peasant, and thou shalt lie with his wife. <laughs> Come to me soon at night. Ford's a knave. And ah. I will aggravate his style. Thou, Master Brook, shalt know him for a knave and cuckold. <laughs> ah. Come to me soon at night. <laughs> <laughs> What a damned Epicurean rascal is this. My heart is ready to crack with impatience. Who says this is improvident jealousy? My wife hath sent to him. The hour is fixed. The match is made. Would any man have thought this? Ah. See the hell of having a false woman. My bed shall be abused, my coffers ransacked, my reputation gnawn at, and I shall not only receive this villainous wrong, but stand under the adoption of abominable terms. And by him that does me this wrong, terms, names. A maimon sounds well, Lucifer well, Barbasan well, yet they are devil's additions, names of fiends, but cuckold, whittle, Cuckold! The devil himself had not such a name. God, Page is an ass, a secure ass. He will trust his wife, he will not be jealous. I would rather trust a Fleming with my butter, Parson Hugh the Welshman with my cheese, an Irishman with my aqua vit bottle, or a thief to walk my ambling gelding than my wife with herself. Then she plots, then she ruminates, then she devises, and what they think in their hearts, they may affect. They will break their hearts, but they will affect. God be praised for my jealousy. Yeah, 11 o'clock the hour. I will prevent this, detect my wife, be revenged on Falstaff, and laugh at Paige. I will about it. Better three hours too soon than a minute too late. Fie, 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 cuckold, cuckold, cuckold. Act two, scene three, a field near Windsor. Jacques Rugby. Sir. What is the clock, Jacques? Tis past the hour, sir, that Sir Hugh promised to meet. May God, he has to save his soul that he is now come. He has to pray his paddle well that he is not come. Begar, Jack Rugby, he is dead already, if he be come. He is wise, sir. He knew your worship would kill him if he came. Begar, the herring is not so dead as I will kill him. Take your rapier, Jack. I will tell you how I will kill him. Well, alas, sir, I, I cannot fence. Villani, take your rapier. Forbear, here's company. God bless thee, bully doctor. 
God save you, Master Dr. Kyers. Nay, good Master Doctor. Give you good morrow, sir. What, what, what be all of you, one, two, three, four, come for? To see the fight, to see the foreign, to see the traverse, to see the his, to see the there, to see thy puncto, thy stock, thy reverse, thy distance, thy montant. Uh, Is he dead, my Ethiopian? Is he dead, my Francisco? Ah, bully! What says my Esculapius, uh, my Galleon, my Heart of Elder, huh? Is he dead, bully stale? Is he dead? Gar, he is the coward, Jack Priest of the world. He is not sure his face. <laughs> Thou art a Castilian King Urinal. Hector of Greece, my boy. I pray you witness that I have stayed six, seven, two, three hours for him, and he is no come. He is the wiser man, Master Doctor. He is a curer of souls, and you a curer of bodies. Huh. If you should fight, you go against the hair of your professions. Is it not true, Master Page? Uh, Master Shallow, you yourself have been a great fighter, though now a man of peace. Bodikins, Master Page, though I now be old and of the peace, if I see a sword out, my finger itches to make one. Mm. For we are justices and doctors and churchmen, Master Page, we have some salt of our youth in us. We are the sons of women, Master Page. That is true, Master Shallow. It will be found so, Master Page. Master Dr. Caius, I am come to fetch you home. Master. I am sworn of the peace. You have showed yourself a wise physician, and Sir Hugh hath shown himself a wise and patient churchman. You must go with me, Master Doctor. Uh, pardon, guest justice. A word, Monsieur Mockwater. Mockwater? What is that? Uh, oh, uh, Mockwater is uh, in our English tongue is valor, bully. Ah, because then I have as much Mockwater as the Englishman, scurvy jack dog priest. Begar, me will cut his ears. He will clapper claw thee tightly, bully. <laughs> clapper the claw. What is that? Oh, that is, he will make thee amends. Big army. I'll clapper the claw me, for big me will have it. I will provoke him to it, or let him wag. Ah. Oh. Thank you for that. Uh, and uh, moreover, Bully, uh, but first, Master Guest, Master Page, and E. Cavaliero Slender, go you through the town to Frogmore. Sir, you is there, is he? Uh, he is there. See what humor he is in, and I will bring the doctor about by the field. Will it do well? We will do it. Mm. Adieu, Adieu, Master Doctor. Adieu. 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 Uh, uh, Begar, may well kill the priest, for he speak for a jackanape to Anne Page. Let him die, but first sheathe thy impatience. Throw cold water on thy collar. Go about the fields with me through Frogmore. I will bring thee where Mistress Anne Page is, at a farmhouse of feasting, and thou shall woo her. Cried game, said I well. Mm -hmm. And me, thank you well for that. <laughs> yeah. I love you, uh, and I shall procure you the good guest, uh, the Earl, the Knight, the Lords, the Gentilhomme. Uh, my patience. Uh, For which I will be thy adversary toward Dan Page. Said I well? Regard is good, well said. 
<laughs> Let us wag then. Right. Come up to my heels, Jack Rugby. Act three, scene one, a field near Frogmore. I pray you now, good master slender serving man and friend simple by your name. Which way have you looked for Master Caius that calls himself Doctor of Physic? Mary, sir, the pity ward, the park ward, every way. Old Windsor way and every way but the town way. I most vehemently desire you, you will also look that way. I will, sir. Oh, oh. Uh, oh Jishu, bless my soul. How full of colors I am and tremblings of mine. I shall be glad if he have deceived me. How melancholy I am. I, I will knock his urinals about his knave's costard when I have good opportunities for the work. Bless my soul. Oh. To shallow rivers, to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. There will, there we will make our pets of roses and a thousand fragrant posies to shallow. Oh, mercy on me. I have a great dispositions to cry. I... Melodious birds sing madrigals. When as I sat in Papillon and a thousand vagrant posies to shallow, to shallow. Yonder he is coming this way, Sir Hugh. Oh, oh he's welcome. To shallow rivers, to whose falls. Oh, heaven prosper the right. To, uh, what, what, what weapons is he? No weapons, sir. There comes my master, Master Shallow, and another gentleman from Frogmore over the stile this way. I pray you give me my gown, uh, or else uh, keep it in your arms. How oh, now, Master Parson? Good morrow, good Sir Hugh. Keep a gamester from the, from the dice and a good student from his book, and it is wonderful. Oh, sweet and paid. God save you, good Sir Hugh. God bless you from his mercy's sake, all of you. What? The sword and the word? Do you study them both, Master Parson? And youthful still in your doublet and hose this raw rheumatic day. Ah, oh, there is reasons and causes for it. <laughs> we are come to do you a good office, Master Parson. Very well. What is it? Well, yonder is a most reverend gentleman who belike having received wrong by some person is at more odds with his own gravity and patience than ever you saw. I have lived four score years and upward. I never heard a man of his place, gravity and learning so wide of his own respect. Mm. Is he? Well, I think you know him. Master Dr. Caius, the renowned French physician. Ah, God's will and his passions of my heart. I had as lief you would tell me of a mess of porridge. Why? He has no more knowledge of Hippocrates and Galen, and, 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 and he is a knave besides, a cowardly knave, as you would desire to be acquainted with all. Well, I warrant you, he is the man who should uh, fight with him. Oh, sweet and page. It appears so by his weapons. Keep them asunder. Here comes Dr. Caius. Nay, good Master Parson, keep in your weapon. So do you, good Master Doctor. Disarm them and let them question. Let them keep their limbs whole and hack our English. I pray you, let me speak a word with your ear. Wherefore will you not meet me? Uh, pray you, use your patience. Uh, in good time. Begar, you are the coward, the Jack Dog, John Ape. Pray you, let us not be laughing stocks to other men's humors. I desire you in friendship, 
and I will one way or the other make your amends. I will nog your urinals about your knaves coxcombs for missing your meetings and appointments. Ah! Uh, Diable, Jacques Rugby, Manost of the Jarter, have I not stay for him to kill him? Have I not at the place I did appoint? As I am a Christian soul, now look you, this is the place appointed. I'll be judgment by mine host of the garter. Peace, I say. Gallia and Gaul, French and Welsh, soul curer and body curer. Aye, that is very good. Excellent. Peace, I say. Hear mine host of the garter. Am I politic? Am I subtle? Am I a Machiavell? Shall I lose my doctor? No. He gives me the potions and the motions. Shall I lose my parson, my priest, my Sir Hugh? No. He gives me the proverbs and the no verbs. Give me thy hand, terrestrial soul. Give me thy hand, celestial soul. Boys of art, I have deceived you both. I have directed you to wrong places. Your hearts are mighty, your skins are whole, and let burnt sack be the issue. Come, lay your swords to palm. Follow me, lads of peace. Follow, follow, follow. Before God, a mad host. Follow, gentlemen, follow. Oh, sweet Anne Page. <laughs> ha! Do I perceive that? Have you uh, made a sort of us, uh huh? <laughs> oh, this is well. He has made us his flouting stock. Well, I, I desire you that we may be friends and let us nog our brains together to be revenged on the same skull, scurvy, cogging companion, the host of the garter. Begar, with all my heart. He promised to bring me where is Anne Page, Begar. It deceived me, too. Well, I will smite his noodles. Huh. Hey, follow. Act three, scene two. A street in Windsor. It nay. Keep your way, Loon Gallant. You will want to be a follower, but now you're a leader. Whether had you rather lead mine eyes or I your master's heels? I would rather, forsooth, go before you like a man than follow him like a dwarf. Oh, you are a flattering boy. Now I see you'll be a courtier. Well met, Mistress Page. Whither go you? I uh, truly see, uh, sir, to see your wife. Is she at home? Aye, and as idle as she may hang together for want of company. <laughs> I think if your husbands were dead, you two would marry. Uh, be sure of that. Two other husbands. Where had you this pretty weathercock? Uh, I cannot tell what the Dickens his name is. My husband had him of. Uh, what do you call your knight's name, Sarah? Sir John Falstaff. Sir John Falstaff. Ah, uh, he, he. I, I never can hit his name. It, there's such a league between my goodman and he. Is your wife at home, indeed? Indeed, she is. Uh, by your leave, sir. I'm sick till I see her. Has Paige any brains? Hath he any eyes? Hath he any thinking? Sure they sleep. He hath no use of them. Why, this boy will carry a letter 20 a mile, as easy as a cannon, will shoot point blank 12 score. He pieces out his wife's inclination. He gives her folly, motion, and advantage. And now he's going to my wife and Falsaf's boy with her. And man may hear this shower sing in the wind and Falstaff's boy with her. Good plots, they are laid, and our revolted wives share damnation together. Well, I will take him, then torture my wife, pluck the borrowed veil of modesty from the so-seeming Mistress Page, divulge Page himself for a secure and willful action, and to these violent proceedings all my neighbors shall cry, aim. Ah, 
The clock gives me my cue, and my assurances bid me search. There I shall find Falstaff. I shall rather, I, I shall rather be praised for this than mocked, for it is as possible as earth is firm that Falstaff is there. I will go. Well met, Master Ford. Well met, Master Ford. Trust me, a good nod. I have good cheer at home. I pray you all go with me. I must excuse myself, Master Ford. And so must I, sir. We have appointed to dine with Mistress Anne, and I would not break with her for more money than I'll speak of. <laughs> we have lingered about a match between Anne Page and my cousin Slender, and this day we shall have our answer. I hope I have your good will, Father Page. You have, Master Slender. I stand wholly for you. But my wife, Master Doctor, is for you altogether. Begar and the maids love me. Manners quickly tell me so much. What say you to young Master Fenton? He capers, he dances, he has eyes of youth. He writes verses, he speaks holiday, he smells April and May. He will carry it, he will carry it, tis his buttons. Not by my consent, I promise you. The gentleman is of no having. He kept company with a wild prince in poems. He's too high a region, he knows too much. No, he shall not knit a knot of fortunes with the finger of my substance. If he take her, let her take her simply. The wealth I have waits on my consent, and my consent goes not that way. I beseech you heartily, some of you go home with me to dinner. Besides your cheer, you shall have sport. I will show you a monster. Oh. Master Doctor, you shall go, so shall you, Master Page, and you, Sir Hugh. Well, fare you well. We shall have the freer wooing at Master Page's. Farewell, my hearts. I will do my honest knight, Falstaff, and drink canary with him. I think I shall drink in pipe wine first with him. I'll make him dance. <laughs> Will you go, gentles? Yeah, here with you to see the monster. <laughs> Intermission. All right, perfect. There we are. Yes, what will happen when Ford arrives home? Uh, so that is a 10 minute intermission. Well done, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you to Susan for reading all the acts and scenes and locations. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying this uh, as much as I am. Uh, actors, you're welcome to join us on stage during our 10 minute break, uh, or you can take a break. And uh, for you watching, please feel free to take a quick walk around your living room or to get a drink, uh, or you can stick around to learn more about the play uh, and to ask questions uh, in the live chat. So I'm gonna set 10 minutes right now. Okay, we got that going. Um, I did know uh, uh, that I wanted to hear from uh, Gideon actually. Uh, you know, there was, of course, when you do a play like this, um, there is so much to learn, uh, you know, not only about like the context of the play and the world, but uh, there, there, was, there was a lot that, that Gideon shared. And so I was hoping that maybe we could, uh, you know, hear a little bit more about uh, the play, maybe, uh, for some who may not be familiar, why this play was written, kind of the festival is written for, and, and, and that history of the play. Do you mind sharing some of that? Sure. Um, so the, the story, the elements of the story were familiar. They come from old tales, all kinds of old tales. Shakespeare put them together on his own. Um, but the scholars think that this was written for um, a performance at Whitehall in London on St. George's Day, which was April 23rd, 1597, which is also Shakespeare's birthday. Um, and the occasion was the Feast of the Garter, which celebrated the election of knights to the Order of the Garter, the Queen's Order of Knights. The formal installation of them was to take place about a month later in um, Windsor Castle in Berkshire. Um, and so it, we don't know this for absolute sure, but all the evidence points to that as being the, the occasion. Um, there's another reference in the play. There's a reference to a Duke, um, Bardolph mm. and Host discusses coming right. in secret to Windsor. 
and um, Dr. Caius says he's not coming. So this, the scholars think this is a reference to a man named Frederick Count Mompelgard. He visited Windsor in 1592 and he developed a burning desire, quote unquote, to be elected to that order of the garter. Queen Elizabeth seems to have promised that he would be, but when he returned to Germany and became Duke of Württemberg, he pestered Elizabeth to, make, uh, to keep her promise. And she told his envoys, no. So eventually he was elected uh, in 1597, but in absentia. And the mm -hmm. queen, quote unquote, conveniently forgot to tell him. So the, uh, th these are little bits of historical references that uh, an aristocratic audience would pick up during the play um, and, and take a little, get a little kick out of it. Mm -hmm. The Duke never did appear. Right. <laughs> um, you know, there was actually a comment uh, that uh, one of the listeners heard the word uh, giantess uh, in this play. And, right. and, and uh, she thought that was a modern term, but uh, here, it, here it appears in Shakespeare. Uh, you know, just another example. I, I don't know if he coined that term, but just another example of something that has existed for a long time. You know, there are so many words in English that we just assume and take for granted that actually come in Shakespeare and some right. of them come from this play. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's always kind of a surprise when people hear a phrase like that and they thought it was a modern term and, right. and suddenly it re it, it's appearing in to have a kind of uh, ancient or at least older provenance. Right, right. Yeah, uh, thank you, Casey, for uh, for sharing that. I, pr I appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, if you're watching this, then you've figured out the technical issues. I think YouTube was having some kind of technical glitch on their end, because we've been here the whole time, but I, I heard from a couple people that there have been some connection issues, but uh, in terms of watching it, but I think uh, I think it we're okay now. And uh, the nice part is this will be recorded uh, so that you can watch back for uh, a little bit. We'll make it available for, um, you know, a certain amount of time. Um, but, uh, you know, speaking of the, uh, the words, uh, and I, I don't know which play it's from, but I, I know, for example, I believe Shakespeare coined the term luggage, right? Like that hadn't been used uh, before, I don't think before his plays. But I mean, you know, like you said, there's so many uh, words that, that come from his plays that, like you said, we just take for, uh, we just assume have, you know, uh, either were modern or have been around for thousands of years and, and it, was, it was him. Well, one of the favorite things to do if you're interested in this kind of thing is to look in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a historical dictionary. And it gives you the, the centuries in which each word is oh, used wow. in a particular sense. And um, very often you'll see that the first use is in a, a play by Shakespeare or a poem by Shakespeare. Oh, that's very but cool. There are oftentimes we think it comes from Shakespeare and you look in that dictionary and you'll find that it was used for hundreds of years before that. Mm. Um, so it's it's a perpetual perennial study to, to um, look up words in Shakespeare and see where they come from and see whether he coined it or, or whether it, it appeared earlier. Right, absolutely. Uh, well, cool. No, it's it's just so much fun. I mean, for for well, I'll say if you like Shakespeare, that that's already kind of a nerdy quality, which is good, a good nerdy quality. But it, uh, you know, even further nerdy quality is to really dive into the uh, etymology of all these things, which is something you know I, I do. I think it's really interesting and fascinating to you know because it's uh, for those of us. Uh, English speakers, this is this is our language, and and just really to dive into well, where how did it start and form and come from? So, um, one so yeah, th one of the interesting words in this play is jealous, jealousy. Really, I don't know exactly what it means. But Shakespeare had two senses for the word. He sometimes used it to mean suspicion. So mm. suspicion of anybody about anything could be called jealousy. So when we talk about the jealousy of Ford, it's not, it's not just the quality, quality that he's afraid of being a cuckold and having horns on his head. Um, I should probably explain just in case anybody doesn't already know. Mm. The image of somebody whose wife 
is unfaithful to him is that he's growing horns on his head that no one that he cannot see but everyone else can see so right. everyone else knows his wife is sleeping around but he doesn't um and the and the image of that is that he's got horns on his head mm. so the the um the idea of uh his being jealous is also the idea of his being suspicious just the fact of suspicion of his wife, whatever he thinks she might be doing, whether it's with another man or anything, taking his money or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so the, the word has this double tone mm -hmm. in, in this play and in most of Shakespeare's plays. Yeah, very cool. Uh, that's great. Um, uh, I'll just mention for the actors that uh, we got about uh, two minutes left. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, your, your time off stage as we get right back into this. Um, and, and Gideon, thanks so much for uh, all the, I mean, we could talk for another hour, I'm sure, about yes. the play, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, but thank you very much for, for coming in right now and, and uh, chatting. Um, and uh, just looking through some of the other comments uh, in the live chat, again, thank you guys so much for uh, sharing your, your thoughts either about lines you're hearing that you're enjoying or, or, the, or the performances. Uh, somebody actually mentioned you know, the idea that it must be challenging for the actors to not have the feedback of an audience. And actually that did come up in conversation the other day uh, as we were rehearsing. And, uh, you know, we're all learning this technology uh, together, but, you know, it's, it's wondering, well, what, what might that look like? You know, maybe at some point we'll be able to have, there'll be kind of like an invited uh, group of people that serve as the audience to be live on this call with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of you're the studio audience, if you will. So, you know, we're, we're still kind of figuring that out. And like I said at the top, uh, if you have ideas or thoughts of uh, things that you'd like to see or, or ways we can continue to experiment with this, um, we want, you know, I would like to uh, continue to do things that are fun and worthwhile, uh, not only for the audience, but also for the actors, for everybody involved. Uh, so we're always, uh, you know, looking at and thinking and exploring what that might be. Uh, and I would be remiss if I uh, if I didn't uh, talk about the best hair. Now uh, there were uh, a number of people uh, uh, mentioned in the comments that people loved. Uh, uh, you know, a, a number of people, like I said, a number of people. And uh, I, I will say, I will let the actor Rob Crisell know. Uh, many people love your hair, Rob. You can um, you, you can choose to let people know if that uh, if that is your hair or not. Uh, but I, I think. Uh, oh oh oh! Look at that. <laughs> So Rob, Rob might have to take himself out of the running. We, we don't want any uh, uh, performance enhancing uh, hair pieces, uh, you know, during the show. But uh, um, Rob, Robert, Robert Pine hair, hair, you're, we can, we can see hair. You're no, your hair is right there. That's not going anywhere. No. Um, but I would say, I think, uh, I think based on the comments, uh, there were, again, Robert and Harry and uh, Rob, uh, a lot of people were mentioned, but I think the winner is Marcelo. Marcelo, where Marcelo gets it. I know. Look at that, Marcel. Yeah. See, you know, you get, you got. Um, oh, there we go. See, that's the uh, the end of our intermission. So um, that's a good way to end the intermission. Best on a hair note. Yes. Well, uh, you know what I love, Marcelo, is your hair almost forms a T with your face. You know, you got the face, and then you got the T out to the side. So that's name, impressive. Because my last name is Two Bear. Just my T for Two Bear. Perfect. 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 Uh, awesome. And too much Two Bear. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that is it. Uh, Robert, enjoy uh, the rest of your uh, uh, intermission snack, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in the second half. Uh, all right. And to all of you, uh, thank you again for uh, continuing to, uh, to watch, and uh, we'll get on with this. So let's see. We're about to resume here with uh, Act uh, 3, Scene 3. So I will uh, hop off stage and we'll uh, head right into it. So thanks for watching. Continue to watch and enjoy the second half of The Merry Wives of Windsor. Act 3, Scene 3. A room in Master and Mistress Ford's house. What, John? What, Robert? Well, quickly, quickly. Is the bus buck basket? I warrant what Robin, I say. Oh, come, come, come. Here, set it down. Uh, give your men the charge. We must be brief. Mary, as I told you before, 
John and Robert be ready here, hard by in the brew house. And when I suddenly call you, come forth. And without any pause or staggering, take this basket on your shoulders. That done, trudge with it in all haste and carry it among the whistlers in Datchet Mead. And there, empty it in the muddy ditch close by the Thames side. You will do it. I have told them over and over. They lack no direction. Be gone and come when you are called. Uh, here comes little Robin. How now, my eye is musket. What news with you? My master, Sir John, is come in at your back door, Mistress Ford, and requests your company. You little jack o' lent, have you been true to us? Aye, I'll be sworn. My master knows not of your being here, and hath threatened to put me into everlasting liberty if if I'll tell you of it. He swears he'll turn me away. Yeah. Thou art a good boy. This secret of thine shall be a tailor to thee and shall make thee a new doublet and hose. I'll go hide me. Do so. Go tell thy master I'm alone. Mistress Page, remember your cue. I warn thee, if I do not act it, hiss me. Go to then. We'll use this unwholesome humidity, this gross watery pumpkin. We'll teach him to know turtles from jays. Have I caught thee, my heavenly jewel? Oh. I now let me die, for I have lived long enough. This is the period of my ambition. Oh, this blessed hour. Oh. Sweet Sir John. And Mistress Ford, I cannot cog, I cannot prate, Mistress Ford. Now shall I sin in my wish. I would thy husband were dead. I speak it before the best lord. I would make thee my lady. I, your lady, Sir John. Alas, I should be a pitiful lady. Oh, let the court of France show me such another. I see how thine eye would emulate the diamond. Thou hast uh, the right arched beauty of the brow that becomes the ship tire, the tire valiant, a ready tire of Venetian admittance. A, a plain kerchief, oh. Sir John. My brows become nothing else, nor that well neither. By the Lord, thou art a tyrant to say so. Oh. Thou wouldst make an absolute courtier, and the firm fixture of thy foot would give an excellent motion to thy gait in a semicircled farthingale. <laughs> I see what thou wert, if fortune thy foe were not, nature thy friend. Come, thou canst not hide it. Believe me, there's no such thing in me. What made me love thee? Let that persuade thee there's something extraordinary in thee. Come, I cannot cog and say thou, thou art this and that like many of these lisping hawthorn buds that come like women in men's apparel and smell like Bucklesbury in simple time. I cannot, but I love thee, none but thee, and thou deservest it. Do not betray me, sir. I fear you love Mistress Page. <laughs> Thou mightst as well say I love to walk by the counter gate, which is as hateful to me as the reek of a lime kill. <laughs> well, heaven knows how I love you, and you shall one day find it. <laughs> Keep in that mind. I'll deserve it. Nay. I must tell you, so you do. <laughs> or else I could not be in that mind. <laughs> Mistress Ford, oh. Mistress, Mistress Ford, there's, there's Mistress Page at the door, sweating and blowing and looking wildly and would need to speak with you. 
presently. She shall not see me. I will ensconce me behind the arras. Pray you do so. She's a very tattling woman. (sighs) What's the matter? (sighs) Now, now. Oh, Mistress Ford, what have you done? You are shamed. You are overthrown. You are undone forever. What's the matter, good Mistress Page? Oh, well, a day, Mistress of Ford, having an honest man to your husband to give him such cause of suspicion. What cause of suspicion? What cause of suspicion? Out upon you, how I am mistook in you. Why, alas, what's the matter? Uh, Your husband's coming hither, woman, with all the officers in Windsor to search for a gentleman that he says is here now in the house by your consent to take an ill advantage of his absence. You are undone. Tis not so, I hope. Well, pray heaven it be not so that you have such a man here. But tis most certain your husband's coming with half Windsor at his heels to search for such a one. I've come before to tell you. If you know yourself clear, why, I'm glad of it. But if you have a friend here, convey, convey him out. Be not amazed, call all your senses to you, defend your reputation, or bid farewell your good life forever. What shall I do? There is a gentleman, my dear friend, and I fear not mine own shame so much as his peril. I had rather than a thousand pound he were out of the house. Oh, for shame, never stand you had rather and you had rather. Your husband's here at hand. Uh, Bethink you of some conveyance. In the house, you cannot hide him. Oh, how you have deceived me. Look, there's a basket. If he be of any reasonable stature, he may creep in here and throw foul linen on on him as if it were going to bucking or it is whiting time. Send him by your two men to Datchet Mead. He's too big to go in there. What shall I do? Let me see it. Oh, let me see it. I'll in. I'll in. Follow your friend's counsel. I'll in. What? Sir John Falstaff. Are these your letters, knight? I love thee. Help me away. Let me creep in here and I'll never... Uh, Call your men, Mistress Ford. You dissembling knight. What, John? Robert! John! Go take up these clothes. Here, quickly. Where's the cow staff? Look how you drumble, you dissembly. <laughs> Look, carry them to the laundress in Datchet Mead. Quickly, come. Ah, uh, now you uh, pray you come near. If I suspect without cause, why then make sport of me? Let me then be your jest. I deserve it. How now? Whither bear you that? The laundress, forsooth. What, what have you to do with it? They bear it. You were best metal with buck washing. Buck? Buck? I would I could wash myself of the buck. Buck, buck, buck. I buck, I warrant you. Buck, and of the season too, it shall appear. Gentlemen, I have dreamed tonight. I'll tell you my dream. Here, here be my keys. Ascend the chambers, seek. Search, find out. I'll warrant we'll unkennel the fox. Good Master Ford, be contented. You wrong yourself too much. True, true, Master Page. Up, gentlemen, you shall see sport anon. Follow me, gentlemen. Oh, this is very fantastical humors and jealousies. Car, it is not the fashion of France. It is not jealous in France. Uh, 
Né? Uh, let's follow, follow. See the issue of his search. Huh? Is there not a double excellency in this? <laughs> I, I know not which pleases me better, that my husband is deceived or Sir John. <laughs> what a taking was he in when your husband asked who was in the basket? <laughs> I am half afraid. He will have need of washing, so throwing him into the water will do him a benefit. <laughs> oh, hang him dishonest rascal. I would all the same strain were in the same distress. I think my husband has some special suspicion of Falstaff's being here, for I never saw him so gross in his jealousy till now. I will lay a plot to try that, and we will have yet more tricks with Falstaff. <laughs> his dissolute disease will scarce obey this medicine. Shall we send that foolish carrion mistress quickly to him and excuse his throwing into the water and give him another hope to betray him to yet another punishment? We will do it. Let him be sent for tomorrow, eight o'clock, to have amends. Oh, well, yes, I, I cannot find him. Maybe the knave bragged of that he could not compass. <laughs> Heard you that. You use me well, Master Ford, do you? I, I do so. Heaven make you better than your thoughts. Amen. You do yourself mighty wrong, Master Ford. I, I, I must bear it. If there be any potty in the house and in the chambers and in the coffers and in the presses, oh, heaven forgive my sins at the day of judgment. Oh. Cigar, too, uh, nor I, too. There is no bodies. Uh. Fie, fie, Master Ford, are you not ashamed? Yeah. What spirit, what devil suggests this imagination? I would not have your distemper for the wealth of Windsor Castle. Uh. It is my fault, Master Page. I suffer for it. You suffer for a bad conscience. Your wife is as honest a woman as I will desire among 5,000. And 500, too. Hey, Bigar, I see it is an honest woman. Well, I promised you a dinner. Come, come, walk in the park. I, I pray you, pardon me. I will hereafter make known to you why I have done this. Come, wife. Come, Mistress Page. I pray you, pardon me. Pray heartily pardon me. <laughs> Let's go in, gentlemen. But trust me, we'll mock him. Mm. I do invite you tomorrow morning to my house to breakfast, after which we'll go a birdie. I have a fine hawk for the bush. Shall it be so? Anything. If there is one, I shall make two in the company. <laughs> uh, if there be one or two, I shall make up the third. Pray you go, Master Page. I pray you now, remembrance tomorrow on the lousy name, my host. Ah, that is good, Bigar. With all my heart. Lousy knave to have his jibes and his muscles. Ah. <laughs> Act three, scene four. A room in the page's house. I see I cannot get thy father's love, therefore no more turn me to him, sweet Nan. Alas, how then? Why, thou must be thyself. He doth object I am too great of birth, and that my state, being galled with my expense, I seek to heal it only by his wealth. Besides these, other bars he lays before me, my riots pass, my wild societies, and tells me tis a thing impossible I should love thee, but as a property. Maybe he tells you true. No, heaven so speed me in my time to come. Albeit I will confess thy father's wealth was the first motive that I wooed thee, Anne, yet wooing thee, I found thee of more value than stamps in gold or sums in sealed bags, and tis the very riches of thyself that now I aim at. Gentle Master Fenton, yet seek my father's love still, seek it, sir. If opportunity and humblest suit cannot attain it, why then hark you hither? Break their talk, mistress, quickly. My kinsman shall speak for himself. 
I'll make a shaft or a bolt on it. <laughs> Slid, tis but venturing. <laughs> Be not dismayed. No, she shall not dismay me. I care not for that, but that I am afeard. Uh, hark ye, Master Slender would speak a word with you. I come to him. This is my father's choice. Oh, what a world of vile, ill-favored faults looks handsome in 300 pounds a year. And how does good Master Fenton pray a word with you? She's coming to her curse. Oh boy, thou hadst a father. I had a father, Mistress Anne. My uncle can tell you good jests of him. Pray you, uncle, tell Mistress Anne the jest of how my father stole two geese out of a pen, good uncle. <laughs> Mistress Anne, my cousin loves you. Aye, that I do, as well as I love any woman in Gloucestershire. He will maintain you like a gentlewoman. Aye, that I will, come cut and long tail, under the degree of a squire. He will make you a hundred and fifty pounds jointure. Good Master Shallow. Let him woo for himself. Mary, Mary, I thank you for it. Thank you for that good comfort. She calls you, cuz. I leave you. Now, good Master Slender. Oh, good Mistress Anne. What is your will? Oh, my will. Oh, odds heartlings. That's a pretty jest indeed. I dare made my will, I thank heaven. I'm not such a sickly creature, I give heaven praise. I mean... Master Slender, what would you with me? Oh, uh, mm. truly, for my own part, I would little or nothing with you. Your father and my uncle hath made motions. If it be my luck, so. If not, happy man be his dole. <sighs> they can tell you how things go better than I can. You may ask your father. Oh, here he comes. Now, Master Slender. Love him, daughter Anne. Why, how now? What does Master Fenton hear? You wrong me, sir, thus still to haunt my house. I told you, sir, my daughter is disposed of. Nay, Master Page, be not impatient. Ah, good Master Fenton, come not to my child. He is no match for you. Sir, will you hear me? No, good Master Fenton, come, Master Shallow, come. Slender, in. Knowing my mind, you wrong me, Master Fenton. To Mistress Page. Good Mistress Page, that I love your daughter in such a righteous fashion as I do, perforce against all checks, rebukes, and manners, I must advance the colors of my love and not retire. Let me have your good will. Good uh. mother, do not marry me to yon fool. I mean it not, I seek you a better husband. That's my master, Master Doctor. Alas, I had rather be set quick in the earth and bold to death with turnips. Uh, come, trouble not yourself. Good Master Fenton, I will not be your friend nor enemy. My daughter will I question how she loves you, and as I find her, so am I affected. Till then, farewell, sir, she must needs go. Her father will be angry. Farewell, gentle mistress. Farewell, Nan. This is my doing. Now, nay, I say, will you cast away your child on a fool and a physician? Look on Master Fenton. This is my doing. I thank thee. Oh. And I pray thee, once tonight, give my sweet Nan this ring. There's for thy pains. Oh, heaven send thee good fortune. A kind heart he hath. A woman would run through fire and water for such a kind heart. But yet I would my master had Mistress Anne, or I would Master Slender had her, or in sooth I would Master Fenton had her. Well, I'll do what I can for all three, for so I have promised, and I'll be as good as my word, speciously for Master Fenton. Well, I must have another errand to Sir John Falstaff for my two mistresses. Oh, what a beast I am to slack on it. Act three, scene five, a room in the garter inn. Bardolph, I say. Here, sir. Go fetch me a quart of sack. Put a toast in it. Have I lived to be carried in a basket 
like a barrow of butchers awful and to be thrown in the Thames. Well, and I be served such another trick, I'll have my brains taken out and buttered and give them to a dog for a New Year's gift. The rogues slighted me into the river with as little remorse as they would have drowned a blind bitch's puppies, 15 in a litter. And you may know by my size that I have a kind of alacrity in sinking and the bottom were as deep as hell, I should down. Oh, I had been drowned, but that the shore was shelvy and shallow. A death that I abhor, for the water swells a man. And what a thing should I have been when I had been swelled. I should have been a mountain of mummy. Here's Mistress Quickly, sir, to speak with you. Come. Let me pour in some sack to the Thames water for my belly's as cold as if I had swallowed snowballs for pills to cool the rains. Call her in. Come in, woman. Oh, by your leave, I cry your mercy. Give your worship good morrow. Take away these chalices. Go brew me a pottle of sack finely. With eggs, sir. Simple of itself, I'll know Pullet sperm in my brewage. How now? Uh, Mary, sir, I come to your worship from Mistress Ford. Mistress Ford? I've had Ford enough. I was thrown into the Ford. I have my belly full of Ford. Alas, the day, good heart. Uh, Not her fault. She does so take on with her men, they mistook her their erection. So did I mine. To build upon a foolish woman's promise. Well, she laments it, sir, for it, that it would yearn your heart to see it. Uh. Husband goes this morning a birding. She desires you once more to come to her between eight and nine. I must carry her word quickly. She'll make you amends, I warrant you. Uh, oh, I will visit her, tell her so, and... And bid her think what a man is. Let her consider his frailty, and then judge of my merit. I will tell her. Do so. Be be between nine and ten, sayest thou? Eight and nine, sir. Ah, uh, well, be gone. I, I, I will not miss her. Peace be with you, sir. Uh, I marvel I hear not of Master Brook. He sent me word to stay within. I like his money. Oh, oh here he comes. Bless you, sir. Oh, now, Master Brooke, you come to know what hath passed between me and Ford's wife. That indeed, Sir John, is my business. Master Brooke, I will not lie to you. I was at her house the hour she appointed me. And sped you, sir? Very ill-favouredly, Master Brooke. How so, sir? Did she change her determination? No, Master Brooke, but the peaking Cornuto, her husband, Master Brooke, dwelling in a continual larum of jealousy, comes me in the instant of our encounter after we had embraced, kissed, protested, and as it were, spoke the prologue of our comedy. And at his heels, a rabble of his companions, thither provoked and instigated by his distemper, and forsooth to search his house for his wife's love. What, while you were there? While I was there. And did he search for you and could not find you? Oh, you shall hear. As good luck would have it, comes in one mistress page, gives intelligence of Ford's approach, and in her invention and Ford's wife's distraction, they conveyed me into a buck basket. A buck basket? By the Lord, a buck basket. Rammed me in with foul shirts and smocks, socks, foul stockings, greasy napkins that Master Brooks, there was the rankest compound of villainous smell that ever offended nostril. And how long lay you there? Uh, nay, you shall hear, Master Brooke, what I have suffered to bring this woman to evil for your good. Being thus crammed in the basket, a couple of Ford's knaves, his hinds, were called forth by their mistress to carry me in the name of foul clothes to Datchet Lane. They took me on their shoulders, met the jealous knave their master in the door, 
who asked them once or twice what they had in their basket. I quaked for fear, lest the lunatic knave would have searched it. But fate, ordaining he should be a cuckold, held his hand. Well, on went he for a search, and away went I for foul clothes. But mark the sequel, Master Brook. I suffered the pangs of three several deaths. <laughs> First, an intolerable fright to be detected with a jealous rotten bellwether. Next, to be compassed like a good bilbo in the circumference of a peck, hilt to point, heel to head. And then to be stopped in like a strong distillation with stinking clothes that fretted in their own grease. Think of that. A man of my kidney. Think of that, that I'm, that I'm subject to heat as butter. A man of continual dissolution and thaw. It was a miracle to escape suffocation. And in the height of this bath, when I was more than half stewed in grease, like a Dutch dish, to be thrown into the Thames and cooled, glowing hot in that surge, like a horseshoe. Think of that, hissing hot. Think of that, Master Brook. Well, in good sadness, sir, I am sorry for that for my sake you have suffered all this. Uh, my suit is then desperate. You'll undertake her no more? Master Brook. I will be thrown into Etna as I have been into Thames, ere I will leave her thus. Her husband is this morning gone a birding. I have received from her another embassy of meeting. Twixt eight and nine is the hour, Master Brooke. Uh, uh, Tis past eight already, uh, sir. Is it? I will then address me to my appointment. Come to me at your convenient leisure, and you shall know how I speed, and the conclusion shall be crowned with your enjoying her. <laughs> and you, you shall have her, Master Brooke. Master Brooke, you shall cuckold Ford. <laughs> God. Huh? Huh? Is this a vision? Is this a dream? Do I sleep? Master Ford, awake, awake, Master Ford. There's a hole made in your best coat, Master Ford. This tis to be married. This tis to have linen and buck baskets. Well, I will proclaim myself what I am. I will now take the lecture. He's at my house. He cannot escape me. It is impossible he should. He cannot creep into a, 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 a hay penny purse nor into a pepper box. But lest the devil that guides him should aid him, I will search impossible places. But what I am, I cannot avoid. Yet to be what I would not shall not make me tame. If I have horns to make me mad, let the proverb go with me. I will be horn mad. Act four, scene one, a street in Windsor. Is he at Master Ford's already, thinks thou? Sure he is by this, or he will be presently. But truly he's very courageous mad about his throwing into the water. Mistress Ford desires you to come suddenly. I'll be with her by and by. I I I'll bring my young man here to school. Oh, look where his master comes. Tis a playing day, I see. How huh? now, Sir Hugh, no school today? No, oh, Master Slender has let the boys leave to play. Blessing of his heart. Oh. Sir Hugh, my husband says my son profits nothing in the world at his book. I pray you ask him some questions in his accidents. Come hither, William. Hold up your head, come. Come on, Sira. Hold up your head, answer your master, be not afraid. William, how many numbers is in nouns? Two. Truly, I thought there'd been one number more because they say odds nouns. Oh, peace, your tattlings. What is fair, William? Uh, polker. Polecats? There are fairer things than polecats, sure. You are a very simplicity woman. I pray you, peace. Uh, what is lapis, William? Uh, a stone. And what is a stone, William? A 
Pebble? No, it is lapis. I pray you remember in your praying. Lapis. That is good, William. What is he, William, that does lend articles? Articles are borrowed of the pronoun and be thus declined. Singulariter, nominativo, hic, hic, hoc. Nominativo, hig, hag, hog. Pray you mark. Genitivo, huius. Well, what is your accusative case? Accusativo, hic. I, I pray you remembrance, child. Accusativo, hung, hang, hog. Hang hog is Latin for bacon, I'll warrant. Oh, leave your prabbles, woman. What is the vocative case, William? Oh, uh, vocativo. Uh, oh. Remember, William, vocative is the carrot. That's a good root. Omen for bear. A piece. What is your genitive case plural, William? Genitive case? I genitive, uh, genitivo horum, harum, horum. Vengeance of Ginny's case, fie on her. Never name a child if she be a four. Oh, for, for shame, woman. Too oh. ill to teach the child such words. It teaches him to hick and to hack, which still do fast enough of themselves and to call horum. Fie upon you. Woman, art thou lunatics? Has thou no understandings for thy cases and the numbers of the genders? Thou art as foolish Christian creatures as I would desires. You prithee, hold thy peace. Show me now, William, some uh, declensions of your pronouns. Forsooth, I have forgot. Well, it is qui, qui, quod. If you forget your quies, your quies, your quods, you must be preachers. Go your way and play, go. He's a better scholar than I thought he was. Oh, he is a good sprang memory. Farewell, Mistress Page. Adieu, good Sir Hugh. Uh, get you home, boy. Come, we stay too long. Three. Act four, scene two, a room in the Ford's house. Mistress Ford, your sorrow hath eaten up my suffering. I see you are obsequious in your love, and I profess requital to a hair's breadth, not only, Mistress Ford, in the simple office of love, but in all the accoutrements, the compliment and ceremony of it. <laughs> but are you sure of your husband now? He's a birding, sweet Sir John. <laughs> what ho? Gossip Ford, what ho? Step into the chamber, Sir John. Ah. Oh, Mistress Ford. How now, sweetheart? Who's at home besides you? Why, none but mine own people. Indeed? No, certainly. Speak louder. Uh, truly. I'm so glad you have nobody here. Why? Why, woman, your husband is in his old lines again. He takes on yonder with my husband. So rails against all married mankind. So curses all Eve's daughters of what complexion soever. And so buffets himself on the forehead crying, peer out, peer out that any madness I ever yet beheld seems but tameness, civility, and patience to this his distemper he is in now. Well, I'm glad the fat knight is not here. Why? Does he talk of him? Of none but him. And swears he was carried out the last time he searched for him in a basket. Protest to my husband, he is now here and hath drawn him and the rest of their company from the sport to make another experiment of his suspicion. But I'm glad the knight is not here. Now he shall see his own foolery. How near is he, Mistress Page? Hard by. 
At the street end, he'll be here anon. I am undone. The night is here. Why then, you are utterly shamed, and he's but a dead man. What a woman are you. Away, away with him. Better shame than murder. Which way should he go? How should I bestow him? Shall I put him in the basket again? No, 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 I'll come no more in the basket. Uh, May I not go out ere he come? Uh, alas, three of Master Ford's brothers watch the door with pistols, oh. that none shall issue out. Otherwise you might slip out ere he came. But what make you here? What shall I do? I, I, I'll creep up into the chimney. Oh, there they always used to discharge their birding pieces. Oh, no. Creep into the kill hole. Where is it? Oh, he will seek there. Oh, on my word. <laughs> Neither press, coffer, chunk, trunk, well, vault, but he hath an abstract for the remembrance of such places and goes to them by his note. There is no hiding you in the house. I, I, I'll go out then. If you go out in your own semblance, you die, Sir John, unless you go out disguised. How should we disguise him? Oh, alas the day, I know not. There's no woman's gown big enough for him. Otherwise, he might put on a hat, a muffler, and a kerchief, and so escape. Good heart, devise something, any extremity rather than a mischief. My maid's aunt, the fat woman of Brainford, has a gown above. Oh, on my word, it will serve him. She's as big as he is. And there's her thrummed hat and her muffler, too. R run up, Sir John. Go, go. Sweet Sir John, Mistress Page and I will look for some linen for your head. Quick, quick, we'll come dress you. Put on the gown the while. Oh, I would my husband would meet him in this shape. He cannot abide the old woman of Brainford. <laughs> he swears she's a witch, forbade her my house, and if threatened to beat her. <laughs> well, heaven guide him to thy husband's cudgel and the devil guide his cudgel afterward. <laughs> but is my husband coming? I, in well, good sadness is he, and talk of the basket too, howsoever he have had intelligence. We'll try that, for I'll appoint my men to carry the basket again, to meet him at the door with it as they did last time. Uh, nay, but he'll be here presently. Oh. Let's go dress him like the witch of Brainford. I'll first direct my men what they shall do with the basket. Go up, I'll bring some linen for him straight. Hang him, dishonest varlet. We cannot misuse him enough. We'll leave a proof by that which we will do. Wives may be merry and yet honest too. We do not act that often jest and laugh. Tis old but true. Still swine eat all the draft. Sirs, go, sirs. Take the basket again on your shoulders. Your master is hard by the door. If he bid you sit it down, obey him. Quickly, dispatch. Come, come, take it up. Pray heaven it be not full of night again. I hope not. I had as leaf bear so much lead. Yes, I, but it, if it prove true, Master Page, have you any way then to unfool me again? Set down the basket, villain! Somebody call my wife, youth, in a basket. Oh, you pandily rascals. There's a knot, a ging, a pack, a conspiracy against me. Now shall the devil be shamed. What? Wife, I say, come, come forth. Behold, what honest clothes you send forth to bleaching. Why, this passes, Master Ford. <laughs> You're not to go loose any longer. You must be pinioned. Why, this is lunatics. This is mad as mad dog. Indeed, Master Ford, this is not well indeed. Yeah, so say I too, sir. Come hither, Mistress Ford. Ah, yes, Mistress Ford, the honest woman. 
the modest wife, the virtuous creature that hath the jealous fool to her husband. I suspect without cause, mistress, do I? Heaven be my witness, you do. And if you suspect me in any dishonesty. Well said, brazen face. Hold it out. Come forth, sirrah. This passes. Are you not ashamed? Let the clothes alone. I shall find, I shall find you anon. Is that reasonable? Will you take up your wife's clothes? Come away. Empty the basket, I say. Why, man, why? Master Page, oh. as I'm a man, there was one conveyed out of my house yesterday in this basket. Why may he not be there again? In my house, I'm sure he is. My intelligence is true. My jealousy is reasonable. Pluck me out all the linen. If you find a man in there, he shall die a flea's death. Here's no man, sir. <laughs> By my fidelity, this is not well, Master Ford. This wrongs you. Master Ford, you must pray and not follow the imaginations of your own heart. This is jealousies. Well, he's not here, I seek for. No, 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 nowhere else but in your brain. Well, help me to search my house this one time. If I find not what I seek, show no color for my extremity. Let me forever be your table sport. Let them say of me, as jealous as Ford that searched a hollow walnut for his wife's layman. Satisfy me this once more. Once more, search with me. What ho, Mistress Page? Come you and the old woman down? My husband will come into the chamber. Old woman? What old woman's that? Why, it is my maid's aunt of Brainford. A witch, a queen, an old cousining queen. Have I not forbid her my house? She comes of errands, does she? We are simple men. We do not know what's brought to pass under the profession of fortune telling. She works by charms, by spells, by the figure. And such daubry as this is beyond our element, we know nothing. Come down, you witch, you hag. Come down, I say. Nay. Good sweet husband, good gentleman, let him not strike the old woman. Oh, come, Mother Pratt, come. Give me your hand. I'll prat her <laughs> out. Oh. I say, you witch, you rag, you baggage, you oh. bull cat, you oh. bunion, out. Oh. I'll, I'll conjure you. I'll fortune tell you. Oh. Are you not ashamed? I think you've killed the poor woman. Nay, he will do it. Tis a goodly credit for you. Hang her, witch! Are yea and no? I think the woman is a witch indeed. I like not when a woman has a great beard. I spy a great beard under her muffler. Will you follow, gentlemen? I beseech you follow. See but the issue of my jealousy. If I cry out this upon no trail, Never trust me again when I open again. Let's obey his humor a little further. Come, come, gentlemen. Trust me, he beat him most pitifully. Nay, by the mass that he did not, he beat him most unpitifully, <laughs> me thought. <laughs> I'll have the cudgel hallowed and hung o'er the altar. It has done meritorious service. What think you? May we with the warrant of womanhood and the witness of a good conscience pursue him with any further revenge? Well, the spirit of wantonness is sure scared out of him. He will never, I think, attempt us again. <laughs> Shall we tell our husband how we have served him? Yes, by all means. If it be but to scrape the figures out of your husband's brains. If they can find in their hearts the poor unvirtuous fat knight shall be any further afflicted, we too will still be the ministers. I warrant they'll have him publicly shamed. And that methinks there would be no period to the jest should he not be publicly shamed. Come, to the forge with it and then shape it. I would not have things cool. Act four, scene four, a room in the Ford's house. Oh, tis one of the best discretions of a woman as ever I did look upon. 
And did he send you both these letters in an instant? I, w within a quarter of an hour. Pardon me, wife. Henceforth, do what thou wilt. I rather will suspect the sun with cold than thee with wantonness. Now doth thy honor stand in him that was of late an heretic, as firm as faith. No, it is well, it is well. No more. Be not as extreme in submission as in offense. But let our plot go forward. Let our wives, yet once again, to make us public sport, appoint a meeting with this old fat fellow where we may take him and disgrace him for it. Well, there's no better way than that they spoke of. Well, how? To send him word they'll meet him in the park at midnight five. He'll never come. You say he has been thrown in the rivers and has been grievously beaten as an old woman. Methinks there should be terrors in him that he should not come. Methinks his flesh is punished he, and he shall have no desires. So think I too. Devise, but how you'll, you, you'll use him when he comes and let us two devise to bring him thither. I, there is an old tale goes that Hearn the Hunter, sometime a keeper here in Windsor Forest, doth all the winter time at still midnight walk round an oak with great ragged horns. And there he blasts the tree and takes the cattle and makes milch kind yield blood and shakes a chain in a most hideous and dreadful manner. You've heard of such a spirit. And well, you know, that the superstitious idle headed eld received and did deliver to our age this tale of Hearn the Hunter for a truth. Why? Yet there want not many that do fear in deep of night to walk by Hearn's oak. But what of this? Mary, this is our device, that Falstaff at that oak shall meet with us, <laughs> disguised like Hearn, with huge horns on his head. <laughs> well, let, let it not be doubted, but he'll come, and in this shape when you have brought him thither. But <sighs> what shall be done with him? What's your plot? Uh, then likewise we have thought upon, and thus... Nan Page, my daughter, and my little son, and three or four more of their growth, will dress like urchins, ooves, and fairies, green and white, with rounds of waxen tapers on their heads and rattles in their hands. Upon a sudden, as Falstaff, she and I are newly met, let them from forth a saw pit rush at once with some diffused song. Upon their sight, we too in great amazedness will fly. Then let them encircle him about and fairy like to pinch the unclean knight and ask him why that hour of fairy revel in their so sacred paths he dares to tread in shape profane. Until he tell the truth, let the supposed fairies pinch him sound and burn him with their tapers. And the truth being known, we'll all present ourselves, dishorn the spirit, and mock him home to Windsor. The children mm -hmm. must be practiced well in this, or they'll never do it. <laughs> I will teach the children their behaviors, and I will be like a jack and apes also, to burn the night with my tabor. Oh, that will be excellent. I'll go buy them wizards. Uh, my nan shall be the queen of the fairies, finely attired in a robe of white. That silk will I go buy. And in that time, Sal, Master Slender, steal my nan away and marry her at Eton. Go, uh, send to Falstaff straight. Nay, I'll to him again in name of Brooke. Uh, he'll tell me all his purpose. Sure he'll come. Oh, fear not you that. Go, get us properties and trickings for our fairies. Oh, let us about it. It is admirable pleasure and very honest neighbors. Uh, go, Mistress Ford. Send quickly to Sir John to know his mind. I'll to the doctor. He hath my good will, and none but he to marry with Nan Page. That slender, though well landed, is an idiot. And my husband, he best of all effects. The doctor's well moneyed and his friends potent at court. He, none but he, shall have her, though twenty thousand worthier come to crave her. Act 4, Scene 5. 
A Room in the Garter Inn. What wouldst thou have, boor? What, thick skin, speak, breathe, discuss. Brief, short, quick, snap. Mary, sir, I come to speak with Sir John Falstaff from Master Slender. There's his chamber, his house, his castle, his standing bed and truckle bed. Tis painted about with the story of the prodigal, fresh and new. Go knock and call. He'll speak like an anthropophaginian and unto thee. Knock, I say, go. There's an old woman, a, a fat woman, gone up into his chamber. Huh? Be so bold as stay, sir, till she come down. I, I come to speak with her indeed. Ah, a, a, a fat woman? The knight may be robbed. I'll call. Bully knight! Bully, Sir John, speak from thy lungs, military! Art thou there? Is it, it is thine host, thine Ephesian call. How now, mine host? Well, here's a bohemian tartar tarries the coming down of the, thy fat woman. Let her descend, bully. Let her descend. My chambers are honorable. Fie, privacy, fie. There was mine host, an old fat woman even now with me, but uh, she's gone. Uh, Pray you, sir, was not the wise woman of Brainford? I marry, was it, muscle shell? What would you with her? Uh, uh, my master, sir. My master slender sent to her, seeing her go through the streets, to know, sir, whether one nim, sir that beguiled him of a chain, had the chain or no. I speak with the old woman about it. And what says she, I pray, sir? Mary, she says that the very same man that beguiled Master Slender of his chain cousined him of it. <sighs> I would I could have spoken with the woman herself. I had other things to have spoken with her from him. What are they? Let us know. I come quick. I may not conceal them, sir. Conceal them, or thou diest. Uh, uh, why, sir, they were nothing but about Mistress Anne Page, to know if it were my master's fortune to have her or no. Tis, tis his fortune. What, sir? To have her or no. Go, say the woman told me so. May I be bold to say so, sir? Aye, sir, who, like who more bold? Thank you, worship. I shall make my master glad with these tidings. Oh. Thou art clerky, thou art clerky, Sir John. Was there a wise woman with thee? Ay, that there was, mine host. One that hath taught me more whip than ever I learned before in my life. And I paid nothing for neither, but was paid for my learning. Out, sir. Carsonage, mere carsonage. Where be my horses? Speak well of them, Varletto. Run away with the carsoners. For soon as I came beyond Eton, they threw me off from behind one of them in a slew of mire and set spurs in a way like three German devils, three Dr. Faustuses. They are gone, but to meet the Duke villain. Do not say they be fled. Germans are honest men. Where, where is mine host? What is the matter, sir? Oh, have care of your entertainments. There is a friend of mine come to town, tells me there is three cousin Germans that has cousined all the hosts of Reddens, of Maidenhead, of Colebrook, of horses and money. I tell you for goodwill, look you. You are wise and full of jibes and flouting stocks and tis not convenient you should be cousined. Ah, fare you well. Where is my host uh, de Jarter? Uh, here, Master Doctor, in perplexity and doubtful dilemma. I cannot tell what is that. Uh, but it is telling me that you make grand preparation for a Duke de Germany. But, 
I'm not trolled. There is no duke that the court is no to come. I tell you for you goodwill. Adieu. You and cry, villain. Go, assist me, knight. I am undone. Fly, run. You and cry, villain. I am undone. I would all the world might be cousined, for I have been cousined and beaten too. If it should come to the ear of the court, how I have been transformed and how my transformation has been washed and cudgeled, they will melt me out of my fat drop by drop and liquor fishermen's boots with me. I warrant they would whip me with their fine wits till I were as crestfallen as a dried pear. Oh, I never prospered since I forswore myself at Primero. Well, if my wind were but long enough to say my prayers, I would repent. Now whence come you? From the two parties, forsooth. The devil take one party and his damn the other and so shall they both be bestowed. I have suffered more for their sakes, more than the villainous inconstancy of man's disposition is able to bear. Have they not suffered? Yes, I warrant, speciously one of them. Mistress Ford, good heart, is beaten, black and blue, that you cannot see a white spot about her. Oh, what tellest me thou of black and blue? I was beaten myself into all the colors of the rainbow and I was like to be apprehended for the witch of Brainford. But that my admirable dexterity of wit, my counterfeiting the action of an old woman delivered me, the knave constable had set me in the stocks, in the common stocks for a witch. Mm, sir, sir, let me speak with you in your chamber. You shall hear how things go, and I warrant to your content Here's a letter will say somewhat. Good hearts, what to do here is to bring you together. Mm. Sure, one of you does not serve heaven well that you're so crossed. Come up into my chamber. Act four, scene six, another room in the Garter Inn. Master Fenton, talk not to me. My mind is heavy. I will give over all. Yet hear me speak. Assist me in my purpose, and as I am a gentleman, I'll give thee a hundred pound in gold more than your loss. Oh, well, I will hear you, uh, Master Fenton, and I will, at the least, uh, keep your counsel. From time to time, I've acquainted you with the dear love I bear to fair Anne Page, who mutually hath answered my affection, so far forth as herself might be her chooser, even to my wish. I have a letter from her of such contents as you will wonder at, the mirth whereof so larded with my matter that neither singly can be manifested without the show of both. Mm. Fat Falstaff hath a great scene. The image of the jest I'll show you here at large. Hark, good mine host. Tonight at Hearn's Oak, just twixt twelve and one, must my sweet Nan present the fairy queen. The purpose why is here, in which disguise, while other jests are something rank on foot, her father hath commanded her to slip away with slender, and with him at Eton immediately to marry. She hath consented, but now, sir, her mother, even strong against that match and firm for Dr. Caius, hath appointed that he shall likewise shuffle her away while other sports are tasking of their minds, and at the deanery where a priest attends, straight marry her. To this, her mother's plot, she seemingly obedient, likewise hath made promise to the doctor. Now, thus it rests. Her father means she shall be all in white, and in that habit, when Slender sees his time to take her by the hand and bid her go, she shall go with him. Her mother hath intended the better to denote her to the doctor, for they must all be masked and visited, that quaint in green. She shall be loose and robed with ribbons pendant flaring about her head. And when the doctor spies his vantage ripe to pinch her by the hand, and on that token, the maid hath given consent to go with him. Which means she to deceive father or mother? Both. 
my good host, to go along with me. And here it rests that you'll procure the vicar to stay for me at church, twixt twelve and one, and in the lawful name of marrying, to give our hearts united ceremony. Well, husband, your device, I'll to the vicar bring you the maid. You shall not lack a priest. Sir, shall I evermore be bound to thee? Besides, I'll make a present recompense. Act five, scene one, a room in the garter inn. Prithee, no more prattling. Go, I'll hold. This is the third time. I hope good luck lies in odd numbers. Away, go. They, they say there is a divinity in odd numbers, either in nativity, chance, or death. Away! Provide you a chain, and I'll do what I can to get you a pair of horns. Away, I say, time wears. Hold up your head and mince. How oh, now, Master Brook? Master Brook, the matter will be known tonight or never. Be you in the park about midnight at Hearn's Oak, and you shall see wonders. <laughs> Were you not to her yesterday, sir, as you told me you had appointed? Oh, I went to her, Master Brook, as you see, like a poor old man. But I came from her, Master Brook, like a poor old woman. That same knave Ford, her husband, hath the finest mad devil of jealousy in him, Master Brooke, that ever governed frenzy. I will tell you, he beat me grievously in the shape of a woman. For in the shape of a man, Master Brooke, I fear not Goliath with weaver's beam. Because I know also life is a shuttle. I am in haste. Go along with me. I'll tell you, Master Brooke, since I plucked geese, played truant, and whipped top, I knew not what was to be beaten till lately. Follow me, I'll tell you strange things of this knave, Ford, on whom tonight I will be revenged. And I will deliver his wife into your hand. Follow, strange things in hand, Master Brook. Follow. Act five, scene two, Windsor Park. Come, come. We'll couch it in the castle ditch till we see the light of our fairies. Remember, son Slender, my daughter. Aye, forsooth, I have spoke with her, and we have a nay word how to know one another. I come to her in white and cry mum, and she cries budget, and by that we know one another. Well, that's good too, but what needs either your mum or her budget? The white will decipher her well enough. It hath struck ten o'clock. Mm, the night is dark. Light and spirits will become it well. Heaven prosper our sport. No man means evil but the devil, and we shall know him by his horns. Let's away. Follow me. Act 5, Scene 3. A street leading to Windsor Park. Master Doctor, mm. my daughter is in green. When you see your time... Take her by the hand and away with her to the deanery and dispatch it quickly. Go before into the park. We two must go together. I know what I have to do. Yeah. Fare you well, sir. Yeah. My husband will not rejoice so much at the abuse of Falstaff as he will chafe at the doctor's marrying my daughter. But tis no matter. Better a little chiding than a great deal of heartbreak. Where is Nan now and her troop of fairies? Uh, they're couched oh, in a devil <laughs> uh, they, they are couched in a pit hard by Hearn's Oak with obscured lights, which at the very instant of Falstaff's and our meeting, they will at once display to the night. That cannot choose but to amaze them. Hey, well, if he be not amazed, he will be mocked. If he be amazed, he will be every way mocked. We'll betray him finally. Uh, against such lewdsters and their lechery, those that betray them do no treachery. The hour draws on to the oak, to the oak. Act five, scene five, another part of Windsor Park. The Windsor bell hath struck 12. <laughs> the minute draws on. Now the hot bloodied gods assist me. Remember, Jove, thou wast a bull for thy Europa. Love set on thy horns. Oh, powerful love that in some respects 
makes a beast a man, in some other, a man, a beast. <laughs> you were also, Jupiter, a swan for the love of Leda. Hmm? Oh, omnipotent love, how near the god drew to the complexion of a goose. A fault done first in the form of a beast. Oh, Job, a beastly fault. <laughs> and then another fault in the semblance of a fowl. Think on it, Job, a foul fault. <laughs> When gods have hot backs, what shall poor men do? <laughs> For me, I am here a Windsor stag, the fattest, I think, in the forest. <laughs> Send me a cool rut time, Jove, or who can blame me to piss my tallow? Oh, who comes here? My doe? Sir John, oh. art thou there, my dear, my male dear? Dear. My doe with a black scut. <laughs> Let the sky rain potatoes. Let it thunder to the tune of green sleeves. Hail kissing comfits and snow errand goes. Let there come a tempest of provocation. I will shelter me here. Mistress Page has come with me, sweetheart. Huh? Oh. <laughs> oh. Divide me like a bribed buck, each a haunch. <laughs> I will keep my sides to myself, my shoulders for the fellow of his walk, and my horns <laughs> I bequeath to your husbands. <laughs> Am I a woodman? Eh? Speak I like Hearn the hunter? I now is Cupid a child of conscience. He makes restitution. I am a true spirit. Welcome. <laughs> Alas, what noise? Heaven forgive our sin. What should this be? Away. 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 I think the devil will not have me damned, lest the oil that's in me should set hell on fire. He would never else cross me thus. Fairies. Black, gray, green, and white, you moonshine revelers in shades of night, you orphan heirs of fixed destiny, attend your office and your quality. Cry a hobgoblin, make the fairy oyes. Elves, list your names. Silence, <laughs> you airy toys. Cricket to Windsor chimney shalt thou leap, where fires thou find unraked and hearths unswept. There pinch the maids as blue as bilberry. Our radiant queen hates sluts and sluts. They are fairies. He that speaks to them shall die. I'll wink and couch. No man their works must I. Where's bead? Go you and where you find a maid that ere she sleep has thrice her prayer said. Raise up the organs of her fantasy. Sleep she as sound as careless infancy. But... Those that sleep and think not of their sins, pinch them, arms, legs, back, shoulders, sides, and shins. About, about, search Windsor Castle Elves within and out, strew good luck, oofs, on every <laughs> sacred room that it may stand till the perpetual doom, in state as wholesome as in state is fit, worthy the owner <laughs> and the owner it. The several chairs of order, look you scour with juice of balm and every precious flower. Each fair installment, coat and several crest with loyal blazon, evermore be blessed. And nightly meadow fairies, look you sing like to the garter's compass in a ring. The expression that it bears, green let it be, more fertile, fresh than all the field to see. And oni swaki malipons write in emerald tufts, flowers, purple, blue and white, like sapphire, pearl and rich embroidery, buckled below fair knighthood's bended knee. Fairies use flowers for their charactery. Away, disperse, but till tis one o'clock, our dance of custom, round about the oak of Herm the Hunter, let us not forget. Pray you, lock hand in hand, yourselves in order set, and twenty glowworms shall our lanterns be, to guide our measures round about the tree. <gasps> oh, let's stay, let's stay. I smell a man of Middle Earth. Heavens defend me from that Welsh fairy. 
lest he transform me to a piece of cheese. Vile worm, thou was overlooked even in thy birth. Uh, Vile fire, touch me his finger end. Oh, oh. The flame will but descend and turn him to no pain. But if he start, it is the flesh of a corrupted heart. The trial come. Mm. Oh, will this wood take fire? Ah! Oh. <laughs> The sire about him, fairy, sing a scornful rhyme, and as you trip, still pinch him to your time. Oh, I on sinful fantasy. I on lust and luxury. Ow. Lost is but a bloody fire, kindled oh. with unchaste desire. Ow. Ow. Whose flames aspire as thoughts do blow them higher and higher. Pinch him, fairies, mutually. Pinch him for his villainy. Pinch him and burn him and turn him about. Candles and starlight and moonshine be out. <sighs> Nay, nay, do not fly. I think we have watched you now. <laughs> Will none but Hearn the Hunter serve your turn? I pray you come. Hold up the jest no higher. Now, good Sir John, how like you Windsor wives. Mm. <laughs> See you these, husband? Do not these fair yokes become the forest better than the town? Now, Sir John, who's a cuckold now? Master Brook, Falstaff's a knave, a cuckoldy knave. Here is horns, Master Brook, and Master Brook. He hath enjoyed nothing of four buck basket, his cudgel, and twenty pounds of money, which must be paid to Master Brook. His horses are arrested for it, Master Brook. Sir John, we have had ill luck we could never meet. I will never take you for my love again, but I always will count you, my dear. <laughs> I do begin to perceive that I am made an ass. Aye, and an <laughs> ox too. Both the proofs are extent. And these are not fairies? I was three or four times in the thought they were not fairies. <laughs> and yet the guiltiness of my mind, the sudden surprise of my powers, drove the grossness of the foppery into a received belief, in despite of the teeth of all rhyme and reason, that they were fairies. See now how wit may be made a jack o' when tis upon ill employment. Sir John Paul Staff, serve God and leave your desires, and fairies will not pince you. Uh, well said, fairy <laughs> Hugh. <clears throat> and leave you your jealousies too, I pray you. I will never mistrust my wife again till thou art able to woo her in good English. Have I <laughs> laid my brain in the sun and dried it, that it wants matter to prevent so gross or reaching as this? Am I ridden with a Welsh goat too? Shall I have a cuck's comb of freeze? Tis time I were choked with a piece of toasted cheese. Cheese <laughs> is not good to give putter, and your belly is all putter. Seize and putter, have I lived to stand the taunt of one that makes fritters of English? This is enough to be the decay of lust and late walking through the realm. Why, Sir John, did you think, though we would have thrust virtue out of our hearts by head and shoulders and have given ourselves without scruple to hell, that ever the devil could have made you our delight? What, a hodge pudding, a bag of flax? A puffed man? Old, cold, withered, and of intolerable entrails. And one that is as slanderous as Satan? And as poor as Job? And as wicked as his wife? And given to fornications, and to taverns, and sack, and wine, and metheglins, and to drinkings, and swearings, and starings, pimples and prattles. Well, I am your theme. You have the start of me. I am dejected. I am not able to answer the Welsh flannel. Ignorance itself is a plummet o'er me. Use me at your will. Mary, sir, we'll bring you to Windsor, to one Master Brook that you have cousined of money, to whom you should have been a pander. Over and above that you have suffered, I think to repay that money will be a biting affliction. Ah. Yet, yet be cheerful, knight. 
Thou shalt eat a posset tonight at my house, where I will desire thee to laugh at my wife that now laughs at thee. Tell her Master Slender hath married her daughter. <laughs> Doctors doubt that if N. Page be my daughter, she is by this Dr. Caius' wife. Oh, 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 oh Father Page. Uh, son, how now? How now, son? Have you dispatched? Dispatched? I'll make the best in Gloucestershire know on it. Would I were hanged, Lyles? Oh, of what, son? Well, I came yonder at Eden to marry Mistress Anne Page, and she's a great lubberly boy. If I had not been in the church, I would have swinged him, or he should have swinged me. If I did not think it had been Anne Page, would I might never stir, and tis a postmaster's boy. Upon my life, then you took wrong. Oh, what need you tell me that? I think so, and I took a boy for a girl. If I had been married to him, for all he was in women's apparel, I would not have had him. Why, this is your own folly. Did not I tell you you should know my daughter by her garments? So I went to her in white, and I cried mum, and she cried budget, as Anne and I had appointed, and yet it was not Anne, but a postmaster's boy. Good George, be not angry. I knew of your purpose, turned my daughter into green, and indeed, she is now with the doctor at the deanery, and they're married. Uh, where is it, Mistress Page? Because I am cousin. I, I married a garçon, a boy, a peasant, Bigar. A boy. It is not a page. Because I am cousin. Why? Did, did you take her in green? Bigar, I, 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 it is a boy. Bigar, I'll raise all Windsor. Oh, this is strange. Who hath got the right Anne? Mm, my heart misgives me. Here comes Master Fenton. How now, Master Fenton? Pardon, good father. Good mother, pardon. Nay, hey, mistress, how chance you went not with Master Slender? Why went you not with Master Doctor, maid? You do amaze her. Hear the truth of it. You would have married her most shamefully where there was no proportion held in love. The truth is, she and I long since contracted are now so sure that nothing can dissolve us. The offense is holy that she hath committed, and this deceit loses the name of craft, of disobedience, or unduteous title, since therein she doth evitate and shun a thousand irreligious, cursed hours, which forced marriage would have brought upon her. Stand not amazed. Here is no remedy. In love, the heavens themselves do guide the state. Money buys lands, and wives are sold by fate. I am glad, though you have taken a special stand to strike at me, that your arrow hath glanced. Well, what remedy? Fenton, heaven give thee joy. What cannot be avoided must be embraced. <laughs> when night dogs run, all sorts of deer are chased. Well, I will muse no further. Master Fenton, heaven give you many, many merry days. Good husband, let us everyone go home and laugh this sport or by a country fire. Sir John and all. Let it be so. Sir John, to Master Brook you yet shall hold your word, for he tonight shall lie with Mistress Ford. <laughs> <laughs> End of play. All right, wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, everybody. Uh, actors, please all come back on stage for a curtain call and round of applause. All right, turn this down a little bit. Okay, great. So uh, I'll run through it quickly. Our cast tonight: Sir John Falstaff, Peter Van Norden, Master Ford, Harry Groner, Mistress Ford, Don Didowick. Master Page, Tony Amendola, Mistress Page, Angie Bird, Dr. Caius and Nim, Jeffrey Wade, Mistress Quickly, Amelia White, Sir Hugh Evans, Marcelo Tuber, uh, Host of the Garter Inn, Robert Pine, Robert Shallow, Alan Mandel, uh, Abraham Slender and William, Rob Crisell, Fenton, Ross Helwig, Pistol, Aubrey Savarino, Simple and Robin, Susan Benninghoff, 
playing Bardolf Rugby, the first servant, and swing, Kevin Manley, and playing Anne, second servant, and swing, Ashley Engelman. Wonderful, everybody, please take a bow. Take a bow, wonderful, wonderful work, everybody. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, thank you, actors, for all the work you've put into this. Um, this, to me, often felt like I could have been watching these performances at the theater, and uh, may we all gather there again someday soon, but not too soon. So uh, thank you again to the City of Coronado Public Library and the San Diego Shakespeare Society. And thank you to all of you uh, watching for being part of our virtual theater. Uh, so yes, uh, actors, uh, again, thank you so much for bringing life to these words while physical space divides us. Um, if anyone needs to hop off, please feel free to do so. Uh, we do have a little bit of time to chat. So if anyone has any reflections on the play or on this process, we welcome uh, a bit of discussion. Uh, uh, you know, of course, we welcome any ideas or thoughts you have uh, to kick anything off or to kick things off. If anyone had any thoughts on on this play, doing this play, you know, if this was your first time uh, working on it or if you had, you know, uh, worked on Merry Wives, either in a production or a reading before, uh, I'd love to hear uh, your comments and uh, ideas. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'd like to go first because I have 2% on my battery left. <laughs> So I'm going to go dark whether I like it or not. Um, I thought everybody did a wonderful job. I felt a little bit out of the water myself, but but uh, watching you all, you were all wonderful. And uh, with that, I'm going to leave. All right, Robert. And, um, Thank you, Robert. Doing it again. Hi, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Bye. Fantastic. Now I, I I couldn't tell if he meant two percent of his actual battery because this is this is draining work you know I I think many of us might be at two percent <laughs> of our actual battery. Um, but uh, has anyone else uh, uh, done a production of uh, or a reading of the Merry Wives or uh, uh, you know I'm curious if anyone has worked on the show before. I have. Okay, uh, what what have you done, uh, Amelia? Um, I can't remember when it was. It was uh, many years ago at Denver Center. Uh, I did it. Um, oh, cool. Or, oh, no. Was it Denver? Oh, no, it wasn't Denver. It was Minneapolis, the Guthrie. The Guthrie. <laughs> okay. And uh, 86. And, and uh, what did you play there? Which role? Oh, this quickly. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that was great. Uh, back, you know, her turn, of, her turn of phrase as I was doing it with this quick down and dirty production. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there were things that came back to me but most of all I've I've forgotten about it but, uh, <laughs> well it was it was a a, a, gen, a a lifetime ago a little bit in the theater with everything you've done since well no no about that but it was it's it's just so much fun when you when it gets rolling you yeah. know after it, after it gets past the you know the order of the garter stuff it really right. it's quite it's quite fun and sweet I like it still i wonder why it's not done so much yeah has has anyone else done done the show or we're, we're uh, as, as we find out with much ado are are, are these all is everybody else a, a merry wives virgin i did it um forever ago it was one of the first shows i did right out of uh, college with shakespeare by the sea which mm -hmm. is a company out here in la they still they they tour all over and it was you know a non-union production where actors would we build sets before the show and then take them down and um, it was running in rep with Othello at the time. So, uh, but it would play to crowds of, you know, a thousand people coming to see the show for free. But wow. um, yeah, I was, uh, I was sweet and, and Paige back then. <laughs> oh, great. Many years ago. Hey. Okay. <laughs> Yay. I think oh, great, I remember great. it. Yes, I've done a reading of it for Antaeus, I believe, with Bob McCray as Falstaff. I played Mr. Twickley, but it was so long ago and we did so many different iterations of that that I had forgotten. Um, we did readings of that. Often. We've seen uh, a couple of productions in New York and I gotta tell you, uh, there were two very different productions. One was a kind of a musical and the other one was a straight play in the park. And the audiences in both just really loved it. They really just, they had a great time in it. So it's, it's, it, is a, it is an enjoyable piece. The musical was, uh, we had a lot of friends and it was just fantastic. One of those things that you go, why on earth this didn't go? And it, it was quite, um, I don't know, 
I don't think we did that a lot then. When you came in, they fed you. They fed you chili, and they... And, uh, and you'd have a beer. And, and they, you'd have a beer. And, and they start to play. It was and it was, was lot, and music, it was a lot of music. It was sort of, you would say, country music. Um, it was all kinds of... Country, music. country. But it was really, really you had good. a band on stage. Yeah. It was fabulous. Oh. And Philly was good. Well, um, I, uh, I I did see a comment come in. Um, uh, Peter, people were curious if you had played Falstaff before. Uh, I don't know, maybe in the Henry the Four plays, or is this the first time you've ever really done the role? So I did uh, the mashup. I, I I covered Tom Hanks in the, in oh, the right. version that we did in L.A. about two years ago. Right. Jeffrey was in it as well, and Harry was in it as well. You're superb. Um, yeah, so I, I actually went on for him twice. And he was amazing. That's, he was that's the only time I've ever done it. And, wow. and he was, I got to say, he was, he was perfect. I mean, he was, he just came on and took that stage and the audience went nuts for him. Mm. I, I was the first it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. <laughs> I thought it was going to kill me. <laughs> I had one rehearsal. Wow. Yeah. And it was both plays, part one and part two, all mashed together. Wow. Um, it was terrifying. And the rehearsal. In the, we we, and at the rehearsal, at the one rehearsal, Hamish Linkletter, who was playing Hal, who I have, you know, three quarters of my scenes with, Hamish couldn't be there. Yeah. So my first performance was the first time I did Jesus. it with Hamish. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's pretty crazy. That's Antia's training for you. Yeah, baby. <laughs> you never know who you're going to see. But there are some lovely photographs that, my, that Jeffrey took. God bless you. Yeah. So you have some memories of it. Oh, yeah. that's great. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Gideon, did you have any other uh, thoughts? Uh, I, I, I actually thought, you know, it was funny. I heard more, um, you know, the, uh, when we were talking about the Duke at uh, intermission, uh, you know, it, it, it was at least helpful even more to me to, you know, hear those scenes, you know, transpire and have a little bit more context. Uh, but was there anything else that you wanted to share about the play? Well, I, I suddenly realized that Fenton tells us that um, Anne Page is going to play the the fairy queen and then it turns out to be mistress quickly so they did a double, she got stage fright they did a double rever <laughs> reverse on us Shakespeare did that. the play seems to me um, a little bit stitched together in a hurry if in fact he wrote it in two weeks as the yeah. legend tells us wow. so there are there are some loose ends in it but i i was impressed first of all by the performance which was wonderful and secondly by the a lot more verbal w uh, wit going back and forth than um, than I even realized when we were working on it. So I just kept hearing lines as jokes that I I hadn't really noticed before. Um, and I think he's the, the, all those comments at the end about English and making fritters of English. Yeah. I think he was really having a lot of fun with just uh, the language for the the court audience. And I had a lot of fun because of that. I I wish that you could have heard me laughing because <laughs> I'm doing it. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at uh, some of the comments online. You know, people really uh, lots of uh, loved it. You know, huzzah, great job all, bravo. Um, let's see. Uh, someone said they saw this production uh, or they saw this SRO in Stratford in 1979. Uh, and and someone uh, in, in the live chat said they saw Peter in that production of Henry IV. Uh, he was so good, we did go nuts for him. So <laughs> there you go. Good. Uh, it's a good it's a good thing Tom Hanks had a name, otherwise he might not have had a part to come back to. <laughs> well, I think uh, you should do it, Peter. I think you should find a way to do it on the stage. It was really fabulous. Yeah, you, it, I'm, it's I'm, it's a good. I'm available. Match. It's a good match. Um, and, and, and I'll take this actually opportunity, uh, you know, with both Peter and, and some of the other actors, uh, Peter's basket bit, that was something he came up with. Uh, you know, I said, okay, how are we going to do this? And, and that was really very creative. And I appreciated uh, Harry and Don being willing to throw their laundry around their house, uh, you know, and all that. And uh, no, I mean, and that's, that's the kind of inventiveness we, we have to find these days. But uh, I really appreciate people being creative and, um, having fun with that. So, so thank you to all the actors for uh, uh, thinking a little outside the box of what can we do here and, and you know, uh, some of the backgrounds and things like that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun, you know, even, even though we're limited in terms of being together in the same room, uh, we can still exercise those creative muscles. 
They're thinking inside these boxes. Yes, <laughs> literally, literally, I'm I'm in this box right now. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, now, now, Gideon, actually, uh, Rob mentioned something to me that I thought uh, I was wondering. He he said uh, uh, he now feels like he's played the young William Shakespeare. You know, uh, yes. there's uh, yeah. so it, it, do, do, is there any? Do you think there's any validity to that? That absolutely, uh, there's that no. There's no doubt in my mind that he named the character William because he was recreating his experience at school when he was a boy. And wow. uh, as I said in some of the notes, we didn't have time to talk about um, the, the quote, the uh, declining the pronouns scene mm -hmm. is taken straight from Lily's English grammar. I mean, English version of the Latin grammar. Mm -hmm. which all the boys who were smart in any village went to school to learn. And they had a pet, just like Sir Hugh, you know, beating them with a stick until they memorized all those nouns and verbs and declensions. Preaches. So and uh, there are direct quotes from Lily's uh, Latin grammar. So I'm absolutely sure that Shakespeare didn't use that name William accidentally. <laughs> right. That's great. Um, well, uh, did anyone else have any uh, further thoughts or comments or, or uh, experiences, you know, from from doing this reading? And, you know, obviously now uh, some of you have done a couple of these, well, certainly readings with with us, but uh, I know there's a lot of readings happening. So uh, if anyone has any you know, further or final thoughts on this medium, as we're all still kind of exploring it and, uh, you know, for however long we're doing it. Is I, I imagine there are definitely challenges uh, as the, as an actor to you know working this way um, even more so than you know many of you have done obviously film and TV but this is something even even more bizarre than that I guess I would say so you know how, yeah Tony what have you what do you think you know it's funny I I almost called uh, Angie and uh, and Harry today because you you know on stage you said these are core relationships we're neighbors we're friends. We're, we're joint husbands, uh, it's two couples, Angie's supposed to be my wife. And, and these are things that on stage, you, the actors gravitate towards physically and you create. And it's so hard to do it within the box because we don't even <laughs> know where the other person is. Right. And, uh, you know, it, and then I thought, oh, they're probably working. And I, you know, just to touch base and realize, oh my God, the most important relationships are you know, you would, there, there isn't as much text, so you would create it by where you literally stand, how you stroke each other, uh, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Ford's being sort of estranged from his wife and, 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 and uh, you know, Paige thinking, hey, Meg, how the hell are you? You know, and, you know, you can't create those things in a reading, you know, so I thought, right, oh. Right. And, and there's so much in this play, although in Peter's case, you know, with the basket, he, uh, he found the way, but, you right. know, having fun with, it's such, a physical play. Yeah, yeah. so much the hiding behind yeah, the yeah, 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 all yeah. that, all that so. People, women and bears and all that sort of stuff we miss. I, I was thinking in general, what I've noticed about these Zoom things is that um, whereas on stage you can overlap things, you can make little, you know, hmm and ha and little, you know, little pick up comments as other people are talking. You can't do that here. You have to be careful to, I've found, to wait until the other person is finished. I mean, you yeah. can pick up quickly that, but overlapping gets really, uh, really dicey. I mean, it's like it's like trying to match something on film. You you sort of don't dare speak over someone. Sure. You know, then the cam camera can't get you. So it's kind right. of thing here, uh, which is also for me. Also, the, with the uh, with the script, and I know many of you guys have been able to put the script on screen. I'm still finding that a challenge when I have all my notes and things. Yeah, well, doing Shakespeare. The, the technicalities of doing a reading are. Yeah, so the, where the eye line is, and I, I got a note in the middle of the reading that I had pages crossing the screen. <laughs> yes, I had, I, there was an accidental red circle, which is what I used for my exit. So I exited one place, the red circle wasn't supposed to be there. And I, uh, I apologize for that. Mm. Um, and also, you panic a little bit because if something doesn't come on or if another person's picture doesn't come on, you're thinking about how do I let that person know? You can tell them if you can't hear them, but you, you can't tell them if their picture isn't on because you can't really stop and do chat. I don't know what to do. 
Or if your internet yeah. dies right before you're supposed to go off. <laughs> oh, no. that's, that's exciting. That's like oh. falling off the stage before you get on stage. And yes. I was so worried for you. You know. Well, I want to put some a positive angle on this that I think is good that comes out of it. And that is, despite all the technical issues and the difficulty of, you know, not connecting as normally, Shakespeare's audience used to talk about going to hear a play, not see it as we do. And I just want to be to reinforce for everybody that the power of the play is still in the words and the lines and the poetry and the wit. And for all the little glitches at the edges, the, the meaning and the, the characterizations come through. And you did wonderfully at that. It, it, it really did come across. We, we experienced the play despite all those little technical problems. So don't lose faith in the, the audience's capacity to appreciate it despite all this other stuff. Well, it's very helpful to me because I'm about to do another one of these. The play that we did in Chicago called The King's Speech. Mm. There was a film about it. And so we did this in Chicago and uh, they were going to tour and I, I don't tour anymore. I stopped after I was 90. I said, no, you can't. <laughs> but I, I've agreed to do this, to go back and do the part that I was doing which is uh, Cosmo Lang, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or as they refer to him as ABC. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's coming up in about two or three weeks. So this has been very, very helpful to me. And I've enjoyed listening to everyone and watching all the other performances very much. Thank you. Good job. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Yeah. I think it would be I think it would be a very different experience if you'd actually memorized lines, but trying to read it from sure. the screen is like so nerve wracking. Yes. And I did word reversals and stuff that drive me crazy. So well, that's uh, that's something we can uh, continue to explore. Um, I, I do want to wrap this up and just be uh, 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 to honor the library's time uh, and hopefully for the cast on, on the Zoom call. Uh, I invite you to check out the, the internal chat uh, because other people, other cast members have been leaving their good comments and good wishes for each of you. So I want to make sure before we all leave here that you, uh, you see all those. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, again, uh, thank you to all of you watching. Uh, thank you actors for donating all your time, your efforts, your talent. Uh, this, is, uh, this was no short amount of work uh, to put this on. And uh, I really appreciate uh, all of you being so professional uh, in this uh, process and you know delivering nothing less than your best, so uh, that that means a lot. Uh, and I uh, I continue to learn a lot from all of you. So thank you very much. That'll end it. That'll wrap us up uh, for now. And uh, maybe we'll see each other another time. So thank you, Nathan. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, everybody. Bye, yeah, everyone. You're very welcome. Bye. Good work, everybody. Thanks. Great evening, everybody. All right. Take care. We'll talk soon. All right.